pressure. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for being her, as I said in the chat. And uh, today I'm speaking with Stefan Milo, um, who I've known for a few years now. Um, we've collaborated uh, a bit here and there. Um, and gosh, when did you first reach out to me, Stefan? I have no idea. I can't remember <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, think, I think you sent me a message or something. And when you were first starting your current channel, because I know you had other channels in the past, but like, yeah, because uh, I remember the first video I watched of yours was um, you were filming along the Oregon coast. That's what I remember. I don't even remember what the topic was. Do you? <laughs> Maybe uh, I filmed a video at the start of my channel. My my first thought was I would only film on location. And so I did a video on a naval base here in Oregon that was the only place actually shelled by the Japanese Navy in uh, World War II. Okay, that was it. That was it. That was yeah. the video. I remember that now. And it was just a submarine just like poked its head up, fired one shell, and then probably scared the hell out of everyone at the sleepy Oregon base. And then they went back below the waves. Yeah. 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 That was a good topic actually. Uh, but I think your uh, channel kind of, you found like a, a niche now that's a, lo a lot different than my channel or. So yeah, go ahead and tell the folks, uh, w tell them all about your channel and your, your yourself before we get started. <laughs> yeah. My name's Stefan Mila. I uh I said Milo YouTube. earlier. I screwed uh, it everyone up. Does. Everyone does. Everyone does. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Sorry. My full name is actually Stefan Milo Savlovich. I just abbreviated it for algorithmical purposes because I thought no one would find my channel if I put my full name. That was one of my uh, two questions. No I'm kidding. Oh damn. <laughs> but uh yeah, I talk about mainly I talk about the world of prehistory and human evolution. That is actually uh what I studied. A university, uh, pre sort of prehistory and, and human evolution, and uh, it's, it's it is what my biggest passion is, I would say, and it just so happened to be a topic that, at least when I started, not many people I feel like were covering on YouTube. There was a lot of history channels, and no one really talking about prehistory, and it's like ninety nine percent of our time on the planet. So I thought I could uh, maybe <laughs> maybe do that. I just tweeted out at, uh, actually, I think one of my questions is related to this, but just how biased all of us are toward uh, the written language, you know, when it comes to history. Like, if, if we can't read about it, then it didn't exist, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the problems. People have wacky ideas about prehistory because I think it's not something that really many people cover in school, not so much. Um, and so, and it is hard to come to definitive conclusions when we don't have that written source. It is, it is hard. You kind of always have to keep an open mind as to what was going on. But most of your videos, uh, by the way, I am totally normally not interested in prehistory or ancient history in general. Like I, I, I usually just, it's hard for me to get interested but your channel um, somehow still captivates me. Like, I think it's just because of because of who you are as a person. Like, that's off, probably the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, well, you know, like <laughs> uh, you're authentic. You're you. You're not trying to pretend to be anyone. Putting on a show. Uh, like, you talk to us into a spoon for crying out loud. I mean, you're just yeah. like. And, but also, like, um, you don't use big fancy words that only archaeologists would or paleontologists would understand. Like you, you layman's terms and i don't know i think uh it's a good gateway to prehistory because for someone like me who's not you know naturally um uh, interested yeah i know um, well so, i mean that's a major part of my uh channel is just trying to get rid of all that jargon you know like <laughs> you'll i'll read a paper and it'll be about like the significance of some of the bones in their feet and they'll be like the proximal distal phalanges is like radiated like 
distally to the body, you know, there are all those medical terms, which for sure the scientists need to know, but we just need to know that the toe is bendy, you know, it's bendy. So it yeah. probably grabbed the uh, branches. <laughs> oh, like anytime you talk about sex too, uh, you you say uh, boinking, is that what you say? Is that the technical term? Boinking, yeah, I might say <laughs> other things. I don't know. <laughs> Prehistoric well, boinking, yeah. I I told I told I'm I mean basically uh, I told Chubby Emu this when I met him one time is like I normally couldn't care less about um, anything medical like but he also just like you does a good job of like not using the jargon like you said and oh yeah. he's totally broken it down like emia means presence in blood how many YouTubers know like what emia means because of uh, the way that he I mean he literally hammers that home every episode yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that is another way to do that. But I think if you're going to do that, you've just got to pick one phrase and just hammer it over and over again, which is quite hard. Or, or sing it. Yeah, like yeah. I do sometimes. Compromise of 1850. I still get people that they're like, <laughs> why do you sing that? What's wrong with you? And I, there's certain things I do sing on purpose because it's like, you're not going to remember it otherwise. It's, why mm -hmm. would you remember that? Um, yeah. I, I, I'm going to bring this up now because the, the previous two times we did this with uh, Atun Shai and JJ McCalla, um, we, the flow was interrupted because of the super chat. And I don't want to like, you know, I appreciate the super chats, but if you could hold off till the end so we can have our 10 questions for each other. Um, but thank you, Alex, for that. And that's very nice. But, uh, you know, so we're, we'll be here for a couple hours. So if you, you know, get bored and you still want to really ask us one of those questions later, you can come back, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I try to, I know I sometimes miss the super chats. I'm sorry, but, um, I appreciate those in advance. Like this one too, looks like, uh, Oh, actually a subscriber of us both. These are the best. Cause like I, Wait, I was telling out. you before we went on air, I was like, how many of our audience, how much of our audience actually overlaps here? Probably not as much as the, my previous two. I don't know. I mean, I do kind of have like I am a sucker for any historical time period. And I do feel like uh, people that are into history, even if it's not the thing they focus on, I think they take a, a, a casual interest in, in all periods of history, really. I think I certainly do. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I guess just people who are curious in general, not just into history because i mean you know we all have our topics we really prefer and that's i don't want to give it away one of my questions is related to that for you but you know like i i think generally history is the quickest way to learn something because you know one topic you can usually cross over different um subject areas pretty easily whereas you can't do that with mathematics or you know, literature or something. Although literature is also a good gateway. Like you learn a lot of history and literature, which I always appreciated. But uh, yeah, let's, uh, before we jump into it, anything else you want to say? Like uh, shout out to anyone. I saw Canubis. Thanks for being yeah, here. Shout Canubis. out to Canubis. Yeah. Another I Portland resident. I'm here in Portland, Oregon, despite my uh, British accent. I am. A resident of the 50 states of America, the United States of America, as I call it. And uh, <laughs> I call them that too. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so shout out to Canubis. You guys have met up in person uh, multiple times, right? Yeah, I need to I need to text him again. It's just I'm not really doing anything at the minute with COVID days. But Canubis, yeah. if you're here, we should go and get a pizza sometime. Because we really live like five minutes away from each other oh really <laughs> yeah <That's awesome. laughs> are you uh in a suburb or are you actually in the the city uh we're both in portland unless you've moved oh. to canubis uh, we're both in the city of portland yeah okay canubis so that city. just means that there's like um drug addicts and homeless people just on top of each other outside of your residence correct exactly yeah whenever we uh go to our annual <laughs> communist party meeting we're always <laughs> we're anarchist. waiting through homeless people yeah actually anarchists and communists don't they like have beef with each other generally 
I feel like they're they're on the same team until the revolution is over. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they're on the same team. I always think it's yeah. funny how certain groups are lumped into to also lately a lot of people seem to think that George Soros, they keep commenting on my George Soros video that he was a or that he is a communist. And he's also a Nazi. Yeah, I, say, I thought the accusation was the opposite. But. Well, yeah, I mean, I've never known a billionaire to be a communist before. That's that's a new thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> is that how you become a billionaire? You you just common you just give up all your private property. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna get started. I'm gonna let you go first with your first question. We uh, so th for those of you who are brand new to this, we uh, the the series is. We come up with 10 questions beforehand that are open-ended questions, so it's not just yes or no, and we we don't know the questions ahead of time, like I said, uh, so it's a surprise. Um, just It's a good way to, to get the conversation going, but also get to know each other better, and uh, it's, it's fun. So uh, yeah, what's the first question you came up with? Well, I'm going to give, I divided my questions into three categories, okay? And I'll let you decide each time which one you want to draw from. To mix it up a bit so i've got okay. personal local or political what do you want to go for um we got to go with political first just because so people can they'll be they'll stick around <laughs> damn all right i'm gonna hit you with a i'm gonna hit you with should america ditch the second amendment oh wow uh <laughs> Uh, no, I think that we should keep the second amendment, but I mean, obviously gun control there, uh, I think there should be reasonable gun control and we can get into the nitty gritty, but, uh, I think in general, I'm a, a pretty, I'm pretty defensive about the second amendment. And, uh, and the reason why is maybe not what you think it's, um, mostly I think of like the black Panthers, um, in the, the 1960s and 1970s who they felt like that was their only way to defend themselves against the police. And mm -hmm. when I think about the most vulnerable in society, um, those who are oppressed, uh, I think about, you know, uh, other societies, historically groups that were oppressed. I mean, think about, um, Jewish people and, Nazi Germany, which is always the go-to, right? For some reason, because if uh, if they had guns, it's a it's it may be small, but it's at least some kind of leverage against a police state that can be oppressive. And so, generally, and of course, that's a big reason why the United States was founded was uh, the fact that the British, you know, they were uh, no offense. <laughs> but <laughs> taking weapons uh, left and right. And I am drinking a cup of tea as we speak. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, hey, I'm doing a presentation on the history of tea in, in the United States in May, by the way, randomly. That's a so that I can't. Well, I'm I, I'm a, a, a slight tension. I don't want to derail you. The biggest negative of the American Revolution might be that America fell out of love with tea. Is that a fair statement? <sighs> Yeah, that's a that's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, but anyway, anyway, um, carry on. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, I guess I'm done. I get because I don't want to get too specific with. I mean, I know what. What are your thoughts on the Second Amendment being a with the outside perspective, not being yeah. original from the United States? Yeah, I. I mean, all my friends. If any of my friends listen to this, they're gonna laugh because I've changed my mind on it a lot. I was actually, I used to be a lot more pro Second Amendment. And uh, for oh. all the same reasons that you just articulated. Um, however, I fear I, there are two things that have made me change. My, well, three things. The three things I would say that changed my mind on the issue is one, I just sort of stopped watching gun content on YouTube. And it's amazing how much when you watch something continually on YouTube, it can really affect your perception of the world. And I keep that in mind when I'm making my channel, I try to, um, because it really, it allows you to continue watching the same content over and over again in the way that traditional television never could. And you go deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole, I feel like. So yeah. for, some, for whatever reason, I uh, stopped watching a lot of gun content on YouTube, so I wasn't being, fed those ideas on a daily basis 
And another thing, becoming a father, I feel like it's unquestionably like it would be safer for my daughter to live in Britain because of guns. Mm, yeah. And, and that's accident. really hard. Just less accidents in general, right? That's the thing that I can... Less accidents, but, they, you know, I mean, there's no school shootings in Britain, for example. Okay, here's a question for you um, that's kind of at least always sparks a good discussion. If you are at a school, uh, like when I, the last 12 years I worked in schools and I always was comforted knowing there was a police officer there with a gun. Are you, would you feel the same way if you were in my position, like if you were at a school and you knew that there was somebody there with a gun, like a police officer, somebody who was trained to use in it? A, in America, yeah. But in Britain, it would be redundant. No one would need to have a gun. But somebody, the always the argument, the counter is that you, someone would illegally get that somehow if they really wanted it or even print it on, you know, with a 3D printer for crying out loud. I don't yeah, know. I mean, I think... I think like organized criminals in Britain have guns because they're going to work nine to five every day committing crime. The crime is their profession yeah. and they have the time and energy to get illegal weapons. Uh, someone that just wants to commit a spontaneous crime in Britain, I feel like they can't get one in reality. Uh, okay. That's a good distinction. Yeah. Like I like I can't stop the mafia having a gun. They're gonna do whatever it is they're gonna do. But they're also, usually they're killing each other anyway. They're killing exactly. Other yeah, yeah, it's not really like they're not gonna do some like you know. I mean, their crimes are heinous, but you know what I mean. As I I hate that we talked about school shootings. I kind of regret this question. I always talk but... about that. Like people, um, I interact with a lot of people who are, you know, rural, more small town, being here in Kansas. Uh, and they always have this perception of big cities like they're crime infested, like Kansas City or St. Louis or Chicago. Oh, look at all the murders there. And I always try to explain to them, well, the vast majority of them, it's just gang violence. You realize that, right? It's like they're, you know, you, you might accidentally get caught in the crossfire, but generally there's just tiny pockets of the cities that are actually seeing this. It's not like <laughs> you go to Chicago and just everywhere you have to wear a bulletproof vest, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's weird what people actually think, you know, like when they think, oh, look, these crime infested cities, like the vast majority of the cities are just fine. Like I was talking to you before we went on air here, like you're in Portland. I was like, oh, so you have a lot of homeless people and people doing with needles in their arms just outside of your residence. Right. Because that's what we <laughs> see on on the media yeah. outlet. <laughs> well, I do. I mean, maybe we'll talk about this with one of my other questions. That is that is a uh, hey, Worcestershire. I know uh, Embrace the Story of Fellow Embrace Worcestershire. The story, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, where I'm from in England. It's widely regarded as uh, Britain's greatest city. We don't. We just don't Is let it? people outside of Britain know about that. Oh, but. I never heard that before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I mean, to go back to, you know, I agree that in, in an ideal scenario, um, we would be able to immediately like throw off any impending tyranny because we had the second amendment and stuff like that but whilst we're waiting for that worst case scenario there's like a million tragedies every day to do with guns and and the flip side of it is since january 6th maybe the people with guns are coming to take away my rights not enforce them is another is another mm -hmm. thing you know how how would i stop like I trust myself with a gun and you with a gun, but there are plenty of people I would never want to have a gun. And, um, you know, the second amendment certainly allows them to. So I, I am not the most anti gun person in the world, but for sure. I think about that. Like if I send my kid to school in England, there's literally zero worries that someone's going to come in and shoot them. Like it's not going to happen. Yeah. And, it, and in America it might. It genuinely might. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. I I think it should be very difficult to get a gun. Um, and, you know, some people may say that's very anti-Second Amendment because it's a right, not a privilege. But I, I do think it's a privilege um, for... It's a right 
to be able to get a gun, but I think it's a privilege to actually, it's kind of like, um, I mean, I understand the gray area. Like you could compare it to a license, getting a license for a car. Like that's a most people undeniably like hands down will say driving is a privilege. Well, how is that different when, you know, there's so many, I mean, look at the leading cause of unnatural deaths um, around the world. It's automobile accidents. So, mm -hmm. well, that's a weapon that oftentimes, and it's mostly accidents. It's not like people are going around. And I would say with guns, like when we say accidents, yeah, there's a lot of accidental shootings in homes and there's suicides, which is a kind of related category, I think. But also like, if you think about accidents in terms of, yeah, it's it's a uh, a lot of times it's an accident that a gun gets in the hands of somebody it shouldn't shouldn't be. I mean, it was issued originally to somebody who was qualified, but then it's somehow. So, well, I mean, at least in terms of, uh, I mean, I if I went through uh, British gun laws, it would shock your American audience. But um, at least in Britain, you're not allowed to keep your gun in the same container as ammunition. Like if someone got a hold of your gun and there was ammunition in there, you've broken the law. You're so illegal. Self-defense goes out the window, right? Because that's like unless they give you five minutes to load it, but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Running uh, between different safes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. yeah, in Britain, guns really aren't used for self-defense. But but as well, again, if someone was breaking into my house, I wouldn't think that they had a gun either. So and there's other ways to defend yourself in your home. But I think it, that just the idea that someone might have a gun, like honestly, January 6th almost reinforced that for me. Like, I don't want one of those wackos who invaded the Capitol to invade my home either. So if they think I have a gun, maybe I do, maybe I don't. They'll never know. Yeah, um, well, I'm not saying I don't, don't but try. I just... Uh, yeah, yeah. But it's it makes <laughs> me wonder. It makes me wonder is I, I just wanted to ask you because my own personal opinion on it has flip-flopped a lot and the as my life has changed yeah no when i was sure. younger i was definitely more hardcore second amendment as well yeah but it's more nuanced now but all right let's move on I, my first question i think since you already brought up where your home your hometown one of i mean this is kind of my boring question um but just tell the story of how the heck did you end up in the united states like what's your tell me your life story <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, as I said at the start, I've got a degree in archaeology, which means that I was extremely underemployed for a lot of my 20s. And uh, I decided to become an English teacher instead. And I was uh, working at a boarding school, which is totally such an English thing to say. I was working at a boarding school, I, you know, and the kids live there. And Very I live there. Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, and one of my uh, friends had gotten a job in a school in Madrid, in Spain. And so uh, on a whim, really, on a whim, I just applied for the job during the summer break and uh, flew out to Spain like the next week for the interview, got the job. And um, I moved into an apartment in Spain and my... Uh, wife happened to be one of the roommates she wasn't my wife then that's how i met her that was a funny way to introduce it but the woman who would become my <laughs> wife uh was uh was uh my housemate and she my wife lives here in portland oregon was raised in portland oregon although she was originally born in vietnam mm. and um, for her degree she had studied nursing in spanish and before she was to start her job as a nurse she uh, came to Spain for one year to work in a school as well. So we were both, we had both just landed in Spain, both working as English teachers, and we met, fell in love. And uh, yeah, I asked her to oh. marry me. And that's it. That's it. I'm a softy, guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm a romantic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so I that's, so that's, uh, that's how I ended up in Portland. We, we where did you propose? Where did, where did you propose to her? Ah. Uh, I this uh not a great story but I, <laughs> I I proposed to her here in Portland and there's a lot of waterfalls here and uh I thought I would propose her at the top of the waterfall I was like wow that would be so romantic how fantastic and 
like the I got her an engagement ring. I had it custom made with a diamond that was in my grandmother's engagement ring. Like wow. my grandmother's engagement ring had five diamonds. And when she passed away, the four smaller diamonds went to my sister and I inherited the big diamond. So I put that into her engagement ring. That's cool. I was gonna, yeah, it is, it's really cool. I love that. And I was going to propose at the top of this waterfall. But when I got there, it's like a major tourist attraction. It's full of people. So I was like, <laughs> oh, man, I don't want to do this here. So she fully expected me to propose there, I'm sure. So we walked all the way up. I didn't ask anything. We walked all the way down. And then when we got back to the car, I proposed to her in the car park. <laughs> <laughs> well, I kind of got you. Like, that's more romantic than where I proposed. I proposed in Walmart, so. Oh, wow, that's wild. Well, but it, it's kind of a cool story. I do like to tell it because, like, my um, my wife, Mrs. Beat, who many of the viewers are familiar with, <clears throat> she, uh, and you are. Um, by the way, she loves watching your stuff, too. She was trying to help me come up with questions. <laughs> Shout out to Mrs. Um, Beat. Yeah, so uh, she worked at the in the Walmart photo lab, which um, this that shows shows how old I am. But that was back when they still you still developed film, yeah. and uh, on you know the old thirty five millimeter camera. And uh, so she developed film, and I also worked at Walmart, but um, I was on the floor, and uh, so I had my brother take a picture of me holding up a sign that said "Will you marry me?" and uh, on my day off, I showed up there and I was like, hey, can you develop this, these pictures? And she's like, what are you doing here? I was supposed to be somewhere else. And uh, she developed everyone in the, the store around the area knew what was going on. I told everybody. So they made sure that she developed it. <laughs> and then she pretended yeah. like she didn't even notice. She's just like, I mean, she was kind of in shock and kind of looking around and I was kind of hiding. <laughs> and finally, I came over with a with a ring that was not the diamond for my grandmother, just some random ring i got uh yeah. and proposed to her there and then there was customers in line waiting and they applauded and everything and uh oh, it was wow. great but then they they were getting annoyed because like she they wanted her to help them and <laughs> yeah <get> back to work. <laughs> so, anyway that's cute that, though that's very cute that's very I nice that story on this channel so that's maybe a you must have been a youngster too oh yeah we were young when we got married i was only 23 so oh, wow yeah. Yikes. Well, I was only 25 or 26. So, yeah, kids these days are just like, wow, how, do, how could you get married so young? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, anyway, all right. Well, <laughs> that's how you ended up in Portland. That's it. Yeah. I've, I've been here ever since. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great it's place. Good. Okay. Well, what do you got next? Are we still doing politics? Are we going to. You can pick any category you want personal, local, political. I do feel like since uh, we're on that theme, just stick with personal. So throw a personal one at me. I'm always a little nervous with these personal questions. Mm, I'm trying to pick. I'm trying to pick. <laughs> Especially with a, a tune shot. He was really kind of, I was probing you deep. Yeah. It's like, oh, am I going to get, gonna check my criminal record here? No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> let's ask what defines manliness to you? Masculinity, manliness. What would you say are the defining characteristics of that? I think it's it's a kind of a meaningless meaningless term these days. Like it can mean whatever you want it to mean, depending on the person. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it, me like um, I think it also means the same as like being a woman, which means you're being a grown up. So if you what it means to be a man or a woman or grown up in general, if you don't want to whatever you want to label yourself, um, it just means you can. You no longer have to rely on other people and uh, for to meet your needs, basically. Like, and also, not only that, you're like, you have enough empathy where um, you are always trying to serve others. So, whether it be in your career or if, you know, maybe you're not able to help that many people with your career. So, it, you're doing other things too. Um, you know, like, that's a big reason why I became a teacher because I felt like, you know, this is, I can get paid for trying to, to help others. And every, uh, every job I've had, that was kind of like, that, that's what helps me sleep at night. Like I, I don't, I honestly don't know how 
Wall Street uh, hedge fund hedge fund ma managers? Like, how do they <laughs> sleep at night? How do they live with themselves? How do they look themselves in the mirror? And if you're somebody in the chat who's the hedge fund manager, I'm sorry, I I don't understand what you do. Like, you, probably you would be happier if you weren't. So, um, yeah. What do you think? Do you uh, you think I'd that's agree. a good definition, or is it? Is yeah, it I bad? would say kindness. It's a very good thing. If you're, there's nothing that seems so small as being like unkind or mean. It just makes you seem just like your person just seems smaller because of that. So I would say like kindness and then, you know, reliability, integrity. No, nothing to do with like, I would say strength at all. Um, but just uh, kindness reliability integrity that's that's what i would say honesty is a huge one. Oh my god <laughs> that's a uh, oh know. gosh that's why i first got into journalism um because that was always the most important thing to me i was always i was the type of kid growing up like if you lied to me like oh <laughs> like it was hard for me to it was hard for you to regain trust like and you know I'm not going to get into certain things, I guess, like <laughs> religion and all that. But, um, but yeah, like, you know, if you be, if you bullcrap me, you know, um, I don't know. It was always important to me, the truth. And for most people, the truth really is overrated. Would you say that? Like, they're, we, like we lie to ourselves all the time, mm, you know? Like, I, yeah, I mean, we all lie, you know, it can't be. Forgiveness is another great virtue as well. So we all, <laughs> we all do tell lies we lie to ourselves we lie to other people sometimes we lie when we're just not even sure of our intentions and so it's almost not even a lie or you're just not revealing the like internal monologue that's going on behind everything you say perhaps um but i can't even remember what you asked me <laughs> I <laughs> got distracted. No, you're right. I think there should be another word for that. There's not really in the English language. Like, you know, we call them... Uh, uh, white lies. Maybe. White lies. That's what it yeah. is. There, there should be a better word for that. Because um, I think that's a different category. I mean, but I'm just, I'm mostly talking about like just deliberate malicious uh, lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People that profit too from lies they, they financially gain or they gain power from lies that that's something that i've always been really yeah. passionate about I, uh, yeah i can't stand that i can't stand that <laughs> especially when you know they're lying yeah and i feel you know i feel like there's many a news anchor people. in america we could say that could fit that description <sighs> we're so gullible all of us and I think that was also the, it growing up that I fell for so much crap. Like, I, I can't believe I fell for that. I, you know, like um, pyramid schemes, you know, like, or gurus, you know, the people that like, I remember uh, when I was even in my twenties, you know, uh, watching certain speakers that were really uh, charismatic and like, you know, and then like later on, you're like, they were saying nothing. Like they, yeah. they, they added no value to my life. It was, <laughs> Yeah. But they may, they make a lot of money saying nothing, you know. <clears throat> I, as a uh, you know, we have to be careful not to throw too many stones in glass houses as YouTubers <laughs> making money saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm sure people say that about me. But, but the thing, okay, th that, I'm glad you brought that up because, like, I think the education realm in general, like ed edu tubers, as we call ourselves, or maybe I'm the only one who calls us that. I think it's a little different because a lot of times, like we tell the audience that this is um, we're leaning on experts, you know, and this is not just something we're pulling out of our butts. And not only that, like we're trying to learn ourselves, like, and you're just along for the ride type of deal. And I feel like I get that vibe from your channel more than most. Like you're just like, Oh, uh, you know, um, there's a road I'm going to go down. You want to come with me and then I can help lead you down it. That's kind of, yeah, I do definitely uh, love. Um, I'm glad you said that. That's it. I don't like to uh, have too many airs and graces on my channel, for sure. I certainly don't want to give anyone the impression that I'm the expert. I'm really not. I always, all my videos, all the sources are in the description and they're very accurately labeled. You can see exactly where I pulled a piece of information from. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think 
again, there's, there's YouTubers exist on a spectrum. There are a lot of YouTube channels that just like, t you know, take an article from Wikipedia and just like turn it into a video and don't, uh, don't delve into the sources in any way. So it's a mixed bag. But yeah. there's a lot of great YouTube channels out there, honestly. There's a lot of, there's so many fantastic educational channels or edutainment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that there are certain channels, though, that never cite their sources. And I don't want to call any out right now, but you should always be a little skeptical <laughs> if they don't list anything. Like they just. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, yeah. Let, that's going to lead into one of my questions. So go for it. Okay, um, so <laughs> I have a question about Graham Hancock. Okay, because <laughs> like <laughs> I reached out to you before because I, I heard this is back when I listened to Joe Rogan more regularly before he went a little crazy the past couple years. Uh, but he had Graham Hancock on, and I was like, "Oh, this is intriguing," and I don't know much about you know this that you know we, we already went over that. But um, like, say that there's somebody watching this right now. And they are a Graham Hancock fan and they believe everything he says, you know, like that he's a legit historian and like uh, all this. Um, what would you tell that person in the audience? <laughs> hmm, uh, that's a good question. So I would say. Well, first of all, maybe say who, who Graham, Graham Hancock is for those who are not aware. Yeah, Graham Hancock. I think he would describe himself as a journalist. I think that would be the phrase that he uses. Um, he is an author who um, believes that in the depths of prehistory, you know, in the hundreds of thousands of years that we existed before writing, that there was an advanced globe spanning civilization out there in the depths of prehistory. And I would say that he mixes the very good point that we have to keep an open mind about what was going on in, in prehistory because we are always just building this picture with the puzzle pieces that we have. You know, just a piece here, a piece there. They might be separated by thousands of years. They might be separated by thousands of miles. Um, it's hard to to create a definitive picture. Um, however, I would say just because you have to keep an open mind um, does not mean that we really have the evidence to indulge any idea. Um, to use the example of a globe spanning civilization in prehistory, if that kind of thing existed, there would be certain things that we would expect to see or certain things that would be hard to explain in the historical and archaeological record as we know it. Like, genetically, we don't see that. We don't see evidence. Like, we've gotten very good at, at teasing out uh, how populations were moving in prehistory and finding evidence of interbreeding with other ancient archaic humans like Neanderthals and, and Denisovans and others, maybe even Homo erectus. Um, we've actually gotten quite good at that. And if the world was connected, at some point in prehistory, I think we would have seen a sign of that in our genetics. Mm -hmm. um, it would be hard to explain the Columbian exchange, you know, in the 16th century, where if there was an agricultural society in prehistory, then why were crops um, geographically isolated until yeah. the 16th century? That's a that, would be, that would be difficult to explain if those two regions of the world had been in contact. Um, so, you know, and, and he has other, you know, Graham Hancock, some of his ideas are really out there. Like he is open to the idea that the Egyptians moved the blocks that they used to build pyramids and things with their minds. Like he really does have some out there ideas, like that they have psychic powers. So, but, um, yeah, I would just say, you know, we have to keep an open mind, but we also have to keep our ideas like grounded in the actual evidence that we have about prehistory.
So. He takes leaps. That's I think that's the big name. leaps. The, yeah, and this guy is a, would be an Olympic gold medalist for <laughs> leaping. Like, <laughs> yeah, but I guess there's a lot of appeal, and it's the same thing with the ancient alien stuff. And you know, like, uh, there's a number of, of YouTubers that are constantly debunking. Um, but it's you know, it's the same thing with conspiracy theories um they're fun they're a lot of fun and it makes um life more interesting i but i guess like it's not just that because if life is already interesting enough if you're really looking at it so but i think what it is is just like there's that secret knowledge and you're in that exclusive group and i think i think that's a part of it i think people yeah. love having the idea if there's like a mystery um but and but history is full of genuine mysteries you know there's so much we don't know we don't have to um leap to fantastical claims i mean his claim is that there was a society that basically existed on the same scale as the british empire at some point in prehistory and that is a really huge claim if his i haven't claim, heard that <laughs> that's yeah, crazy if, if his claim was that you know, the more we understand about the genetics in particular, the more we are unable, the more we're able to unwrap like um, events in prehistory that went otherwise unrecorded. Like my next video, I'll give you a sneak preview on it. Ooh. There's been a long debate in archaeology about whether the Polynesian people made ah. it to the Americas. Yes. And at least according to our current understanding of genetics, that's a yes, they did. And and so there are like real mysteries out there in archaeology and prehistory for sure. And we certainly don't know even close to everything. But just but again, it's just, you know, keep your ideas in reality. You know, the Egyptians did not. I will. I'm going to go out on a limb and say the Egyptians did not build the pyramids with psychic powers. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there was not a society and a super advanced society like Atlantis. I mean, really, these these people all sincerely believe in Plato's Atlantis is what it all boils down to. If mm. he hadn't written that bloody book, um, we wouldn't have many of these ideas and misconceptions about prehistory. But it was Plato. He was a genius. So surely <laughs> yeah. everything he wrote was genius. He was a philosopher, not a historian. He was trying to make a point <laughs> about political <laughs> systems. Intent matters. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's no evidence that anyone from his time viewed these texts as historical um they mm. viewed him as a philosopher yeah and, uh, and he also wrote in another book so he wrote in uh this like dialogue between two characters like timaeus and something i can't remember the names of the characters that talk about the atlantis myth and plato's stories but in a in a separate book he also wrote that like myths and legends exist so that we can teach people lessons about like philosophy and morality and it's like oh so he had the he has the opinion that these <laughs> things exist to teach lessons so we shouldn't take his words so seriously mm -hmm. on these on these matters and especially because he's like this happened nine thousand years ago and this guy's granddad told me about it like nine thousand years is a long time to carry down a story but yeah well, uh, somebody was in the chat was asking other channels that are debunking these and or channel recommendations. Uh, and somebody said World of Antiquity. That's a good one. Are, are any other channels to shout out like that? That are I certainly of... think that David, uh, who David Miano, Doctor David Miano, who does World of Antiquity, he is the he is mm -hmm. the best at it. He's so polite. My next video that should maybe be out tomorrow if I finish editing it today. Sorry, like I said, next video twice now. I've just made a small little mini video because I just went to a, an art gallery about, um, I just saw a display of ancient Egyptian art. And there is this idea that many of the granite uh, statues, the statues made from hard rocks could not have been produced by the ancient Egyptians because you can't, they didn't have the technology available to them, which isn't true. But I just, I just like, okay, so let's say that true. How would you explain this, this, and this? And I'm asking uh, different questions of that idea. Like, for a start, how do you explain the Egyptian writing on these monuments? How do you explain the fact that there's no Atlantean writing on them? 
how do you explain the fact that the like style of art changes over the course of Egyptian history? Um, different things like that that you know you couldn't explain. So, so I would I would say if you back to the original original question, if you are a fan of Graham Hancock, that's absolutely fine. You can believe anything you want, but and I ask critical questions of every every idea. You know, you're more than fine. Like, welcome to scrutinize any idea that I present on my channel, and I would do the same to Graham Hancock or anyone else who presents a vision of the past when we have so few pieces, you know, just think critically, like ask hard questions of the idea. I think a lot of what we do is asking the appropriate questions. And like, you got to know which questions to ask. Um, so I think that's kind of guides how we research, I think. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. Oh, it looks like Emperor Tiger Star is in the chat. Nice. Serene Brady Haran. I don't know who that is, but I'll take it as a compliment. Oh, he's great. He's uh he's from Australia originally, uh, but he um has the channel number file and a bunch of other ones. Oh yeah, yeah, I do know that guy. Yeah, I just didn't sure. know his name. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, what's Thanks, your second Emperor? question? Should we go local this time? Is sure. this the last category that you have yeah. from? So one thing I'm desperate to know about people that live in the Midwest. Coming from an island, and then I moved to the West Coast. When you have like three or four days and the beach isn't an option, like what do people in Kansas do? You've <laughs> just got like three or four days off. What's a Kansan going to do? Because in uh, Oregon and Britain, the answer is the same. We're going to go to the beach. We have beaches on lakes. Ah, I mean, like that's not a proper beach. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go uh, to a lake. You go to a lake. Do you think? Actually, seriously, that's what we do. We go like go to the lake, and uh, a lot of people boat and fish and jet ski and all that. Um, I personally don't do that, um, but you know, if you're not doing that, then <laughs> you're jumping in. <laughs> you're jumping in the creek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of depressing. I mean, the, the thing about the Midwest, though, like, um, you know, the Great Lakes, um, I, I don't live that close to the Great Lakes. But I know, that's super far from you as well. <laughs> I was going to say, that's the next know. best thing. Um, yeah, being landlocked is hard. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I assume that there's more people um, that are not as strong as swimmers uh, that live around where I do for that reason, because we don't really have the opportunities to go. <laughs> To the ocean. I mean, swimming in the sea is dangerous. I don't like to do it much either, to be honest. It is, it but can be dangerous. It can be dangerous. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, people swim in rivers around here and there's undercurrents that will just take you away. Like I had a former student a couple of years ago that almost died. And then you do hear about news stories every, every year, like kids that die in a river because of the, getting swept under the, um, with the undercurrent. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not, that's something that I think, uh, in my opinion, is not that big a deal because I just don't have a desire to go to the beach. You know, like if I, people always ask that qu classic question, would you rather live by the ocean or by the beach or in the mountains? I always say mountains. So, really? <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't need the beach. Yeah. Oh, man. I <laughs> love chilling on the beach. It's the best. Um, Let's get a little beach house on the go. It's so good. See that okay, that leads to my next question for you because I, I do know that you like to hike, right? Yeah. Okay, I love to hike. Um uh, and you know, like it's harder with, with kids. Um, but even you know, I used to put my daughter when she was a baby, like my oldest, um, into a one of those back backpack things where she just fits on my back. Um, but yeah, like I I would take her out too. I mean, I uh so other than hiking, uh are there other outdoorsy stuff that you do or like, what are your general hobbies? Cause like, I was like, Oh yeah. Other, uh, I, other quite like, <laughs> I quite like a good, a uh, good bit of cycling. I do like to ride my bike. Ah, um, no idea. Yeah. Yeah. That's great fun. That's like my favorite way to get around town sometimes as long as the weather's okay. Um, it's more bike friendly there than probably around where I live. <laughs> yeah. Portland is pretty bike friendly for a, uh, American city. Did you know about the annual like naked bike thing here in Portland? Oh, I think I did hear about that once. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like every, you, you get naked on a bike every year. 
I haven't done it. I should do it. I should do it. But um, yeah, every year, like several hundred people gather to cycle a route around Portland, totally naked. And in theory, it's to raise awareness about how vulnerable cyclists are to traffic. But I think in reality, it's just an excuse to ride around naked. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've I've seen it though. I've seen it. I've like been uh, outside whilst they've gone past, and I've given them a thumbs up and a wee as they've. Cycled it's not past. illegal to to do that. I thought it's illegal to be naked in most places in the United States. <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> They just let it slide because it should become a bit of a local tradition. I think if you didn't do it on that day, you would get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you can't be naked today. You can only yeah. be naked on this day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they do it. They do it at night at nine o'clock. So you'd have to. Uh, oh. You'd have to have really good vision to be scandalized, you know. And they're cycling <laughs> pretty quick. Problem, We're gonna go yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But uh, yeah, yeah, I love uh, I I do love the outdoors, uh, hiking, camping. I don't really do anything that when I'm out there. I don't hunt or fish or anything like that. I just like walking around, and um, yeah, cycling. Um, those are the the big ones. I mean, honestly, my time. I've my daughter's two next month, and I don't even know how I had so much free time before I had a kid. Oh, like God. I haven't done any of my hobbies in so long. It's yeah. so hard. Tell me about so, it. <laughs> yeah. So, but in theory, those are my hobbies. I really want to get into uh, pottery and canoeing, though. I know there's two very different things, but I, lo- I really enjoy pottery as an art form. You so could pot- like... do pottery on a canoe as well. I'm, I'm I sure. could. Yeah. I could combine the two activities. <laughs> yeah. And I took some uh, canoeing uh, lessons and started learning to canoe last year. So hopefully I'll keep that up. Not that it's crazy difficult, but you got to respect the water, man. I almost drowned one time, so I always respect water. Uh, uh, wow. What, well, you got to tell me about that. You almost drowned? As, yeah, I was swimming across a lake in the Czech Republic, and uh, it wasn't even that big, but I got to the center of the lake, and the water just like plummeted in temperature. I have no idea how deep this lake was, but the water was freezing cold, and I was starting to cramp up. Oh. And so was a friend of mine. And um, like we, I, like he actually grabbed hold of me thinking he wasn't going to make it. Oh my God. And, I, and and we both went under the water. And just before I went under the water, I said like, Pete, if you don't let go, we're both going to die. And then we like went oh. under the water because <laughs> he had grabbed me from the back because he had gotten scared. He had hopped on my back and I was struggling as well. Oh my God. Fortunately, he let go and we just dragged ourselves to the other shore. And then, annoyingly, we had to walk all the way around this lake in the forest in nothing but our underwear, like soaking wet, freezing cold, walking through the forest, just in our undies. But, but yeah, you gotta res- kids, you gotta respect the water, man. It's all fun and games, but it can it can flip like that. You gotta respect the water. Take swimming lessons. I'm not that good of a swimmer. I I never not wear a life jacket when I'm out there. Like I have kayaked. Um, a couple times, well, no, three times in my life. I that's one thing I want to do more of is kayaking. Yeah. But yeah, like um, it depends on where because some of those rivers and even streams can, even in Kansas, <laughs> like you just don't yeah. know when, when there's going to be a rock or a, and then wildlife as well. We've got water moccasins that are uh, you know just hanging out in the water sometimes. What's a water moccasin? Is that a crocodile? No, oh, you don't have crocodiles in Kansas. Sorry, that was a crazy question. <laughs> yeah, it's a snake that's poisonous, uh, you know, they're, and they're a little aggressive sometimes. Uh, okay. Like I, I am more afraid of them than rattlesnakes. At least rattlesnakes, you can kind of hear them. And uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, uh, you've probably got lots of stories like that. I isn't it amazing how we're alive? And at like, <laughs> you think about all the times. Uh, so I don't know. You gotta live live your little bit, you know. Uh you do. Live life okay. to the full, but always respect water. <laughs> <laughs> That's the theme of this uh episode. Then. Yeah. Respect water. Yeah. All right. I think it's uh my turn. Wait, have you asked three yet? Or you just asked my hobbies, so I guess it's my oh, turn. It's your turn. Okay. Do you want to go political again? Political? Yeah, we might as well keep go through the cycle. All right. 
What's the most important reform that the current Biden administration could pass in your mind? What's their highest priority? Oh, yeah. I think the highest priority is health care. Um, I, you know, I'm a little biased because of my personal experiences with um, the American healthcare system. Uh, I always I've told this story before on one live stream, but um, generally I'm pretty libertarian with my um, beliefs. So I think government is not like efficient and good at doing things and running things, but they are pretty darn good at spending money, like just giving people money. Like we got you covered. We're going to pay for your health insurance. So you don't have to go bankrupt or go to GoFundMe to pay your medical bills. Like, cause you don't, you never know what's going to happen. So the story I always bring up for my life, you know, being selfish as I am is, uh, me refusing to go to the emergency room um, when I was, when my appendix burst, you know, like yeah. uh, for starters, I was like, oh, you know, it can't be that bad. I mean, even though I was in excruciating pain, probably the most pain I've ever been in my life. Um, but, you know, I was literally pacing back and forth of the ER because I knew once I went in there, it would be a thousand dollar charge for me or approximately. Um, and that's with pretty darn good el uh, health insurance as a, as a government worker, you know, as a teacher, because yeah. usually, um, you know, you work for any government institution. It, that's one of the assumptions still is that you have decent benefits and retirement and, and insurance. And nope, uh, I still, you know, I worried about deductible, the deductible, um, and then the bill that would always come later on, which it did. But just the fact that I, you know, how could it be that I, you know, <laughs> like literally people every day in this country refuse to go to the hospital because they worry about the bill? How dystopian is that? Especially yeah. when you look at how much money uh, our country has, like material wealth, like GDP. Um, you know, you look at all the money spent on useless things, most of it military spending, and uh, you're like, can't you just take some of that, some of that to like, you know, help like, so I don't have to, and it's okay. I want private insurance to still exist. Obviously I want competition. I still want markets. I just want there to be something in place like, and it, it, we can model it after Taiwan, which has a pretty good system. Canada gets a lot of crap, you know, because, oh, Canada, there's wait times. Oh, really? Well, let me tell you, Mrs. Beat had to wait months before she could see a cardiologist. Yeah, so, I, I never get that argument. To, yeah, I never get, because... just a, they're just as bad here in the United States at times as they are in Canada. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing, I couldn't agree more, but another thing, the problem, in my opinion, with having separate private systems is um like when i decided to leave my job to be a full-time youtuber i went on my wife's insurance and she has a different insurance provider so i had um to um basically like switch a doctor like and just by coincidence i had a like a health problem and when i needed to do that switch and before I saw the specialist, it probably took five months to see that doctor because I've got to get into the new hospital system, which yep. takes time. And then I've got to see a regular doctor, which takes time because I'm they a new patient. And then they've got to refer me. It was probably five or six months before I actually saw the doctor about the problem I had. I can, I can even show you it right now. Like uh, I get eczema and I, I had a really bad breakout in my hand. And this is kind of gnarly, but it's like killed my... <laughs> That's awesome. But the, but the eczema has basically like permanently killed my thumbnail because oh I couldn't God. see a doctor in time. Whereas oh in Britain, God. yeah, in Britain, that wouldn't have been a problem. You know, I wouldn't have had to have waited to be on a new system. I wouldn't have to waited to get in a new doctor because it's all just the one system. And and that delay has like that delay has like permanently cost me my thumbnail, I feel like. Wow. Yeah, it's well, and I'm a pretty healthy dude. I mean, I eat eat healthy i go to the gym regularly and but your appendix bursting is not something that you can just like prepare for it, oh yeah in exactly yeah, nine no. years of and course four, four months yeah. i can prepare i can save up money for when my appendix bursts so when i i'll have thousands of dollars like and then 
the other part of it is this buying health insurance. Oh, well, you can get uh, government subsidized health care on the marketplace. Oh, yeah. OK, and then you go there and you look at how much coinsurance, deductibles and um, co-pays. And, you know, it, it's um, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And I I guess I'm frustrated, though, because I don't see any change coming anytime soon. Uh, I, I think. You know, I think healthcare is a right, and I've come. To, I, it took me a long time to reach that conclusion. I used to think that it was a privilege, but if we think life is a right, then how can we say healthcare isn't a privilege? Like you need healthcare to stay alive, <laughs> and yeah. so I, um, you know, it's something like 71, 72 percent. I saw a recent poll of how many Americans want universal healthcare of some form. And yet we're not seeing any signs that's going to happen anytime soon, which they could change. But I don't know. I uh, I, don't, I wish more people were upset about it. I'm a, I'm about to like I was I had this idea to like just start a protest movement and uh, uh, go to gated communities like right and just start burning healthcare bills and uh, like have them <laughs> or shred them or something to yeah because like. The people people that make enough money they don't see it, they don't see it. The people that they, they can afford the deductibles and the the premiums. Um, the people that it just breaks my heart. All the people that need health care the most they can't afford to get it. Like they want health insurance. Yeah. Uh, but that like and the fact that you have to like if you want decent health insurance you have to usually have a white collar job. Like that's, yeah. that's a whole nother element that's messed up. Anyway, I could go on forever. I'll stop. I mean, well, you're right. It's a Travis in the richest country in the world. People die because they can't afford their insulin and things like that. It's an absolute travesty. It's a moral yeah. travesty. I, I had a friend, I had a friend who went, who lost everything because he had terminal cancer. He ended up surviving, but he had the insurance company. This is before Obamacare. But the insurance company kicked him to the curb. They said, we're not covering you anymore. Wow, and that's he, terrible. His assets were seized. Like, um, yeah. So yeah, just to contrast that, just for an American listener, just to quickly contrast that. Uh, I lived in Serbia for two years and just, I fell ill. Just one day I fell ill and uh, I just had the run. So I was having a terrible time on the toilet <laughs> to paint you guys a picture. <laughs> you got pictures for that? Yeah. yeah. And I, and I just wanted to see a doctor. And so, you know, I was just there as living like temporarily, like no official status or anything like that. And the doctor saw me. And at the end of it, you know, I asked about the payment cause I'm not a Serbian citizen. I have never paid a penny in taxes to Serbia or anything like that. And he just waved it off and he was like, don't worry about it. Just like get the medicine, get better. Don't worry about paying me. And Serbia is probably poorer than every single state in the United States, the country. Every Individually, every state is probably richer than Serbia. Even Mississippi. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe with that one exception, I don't know, but maybe, yeah. it, but it could be, it seriously could be. And mm -hmm. it's like, how was I treated so well as a foreigner in this wildly poor country compared to america yeah. but in america like i have to wait ages and they're checking my insurance and if i don't have it they're kicking me to the curb you know it's is that the so is that the issue that probably is most important to you or is there another issue that you think is more important than healthcare? So i mean I'll... shout out to will who said uh uh student loan debt was his issue <laughs> i mean there's there's a lot of issues there's a lot of issues healthcare i think healthcare could improve so many people's lives here it's uh it's because if you don't have to worry about one. that then then it, you know it just takes such a load off your chest like yeah. you almost you almost become sort of like a slave to your employer because you're so concerned about losing your health care i like, recently it, jumped it in makes with you less YouTube full time too, and that was the biggest reason why i didn't want to do youtube full time is like i, I can't afford in insurance but i'm my wife works for the state of Kansas and I have health insurance through her now and most of her paycheck goes to paying for it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on. I would like to this, I'm trying to make it. So the questions are related to what we're talking about, but you mentioned Serbia. Uh, yeah. What are your favorite places in the entire world and why?
Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I stumped so, them. Yeah, the favorite places in the whole world. I don't know. Um, there's so many. I haven't. I do. One of my life's ambitions is to visit every continent. So far, I've only done two: Europe and North America. So I'm not doing very well. Um, but so so I can only pick from those two places. I guess these are places I have to have been before. I think um, one place where I I just didn't really have a lot of preconceptions about what life was like there. And so I was absolutely amazed, really, was the Czech Republic. Uh, that's a fantastic little country. My the sister-in-law um, studied abroad there. Oh, that's how I got to stay there. That's actually where I almost drowned in that bloody lake. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But uh, so screw their lakes. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought the people were like absolutely fantastic. And, and it's a really beautiful little country. And there was a, a town there called um, Chesky Krumlov. It's a it's like a it's a medieval town it's like it's come straight out of a walt disney movie really it's it's so oh, yeah, beautiful definitely. yeah and um because it's you know not super common for people to visit the czech republic as compared to like france or italy it's it's much cheaper so you can have a yeah. you can have a great time over there you really can it's, it's fantastic and uh i would i would jump at any opportunity to go back um you know, I, I, I honestly, I feel like I've, I've never visited anywhere I haven't liked. There's always something interesting going on. Uh, Vienna is another fantastic city. Um, it's, it's brilliant. A lot of fun. Uh, Hawaii is incredible. Like mm -hmm. I was, I went to Maui just the year before I had my daughter, and it, and it's fantastic out there. It's really incredible. Um. Gosh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and uh, and uh, Serbia and Britain, of course, are great, but they're Worcester, obviously, exactly embraces the story. Yeah, <laughs> Worcester is uh, the gem of England, but if I hype it up too much, then it's going to get overrun with tourists. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's uh, it's brilliant. Wales in the UK is really great. It's very um, not many people visit Britain, go to Wales, and they totally mm. should. It's very You're right. Picturesque. We were we still are planning on going to England and Scotland. Actually, Wales wasn't on the list, but maybe we should consider reconsider. I, uh, we, we were supposed to go, you know, two years ago, but then the pandemic. Oh, damn, yeah. Uh, well, Scotland, uh, Scotland is and England are fantastic too. Don't get me wrong. Scotland is, is great. Um, but yeah, Wales is just, it's just off the beaten track. You know, not many people visit there. I was gonna say and it never gets the attention. It's always overshadowed. It's really overshadowed, but it, it's great. It's very picturesque. Uh, the most amount of castles in the whole of the UK, I would imagine, are in Wales. Definitely in like, in terms of castles per vacation, Wales is gonna really be up there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's lots of great places, really. But that's that's just off the top of my head. What I I would say I love. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm always curious. I, I'm kind of like you. Pretty much wherever I go, I'll find something about it I like. Um, I love to travel. Um, but my favorite place on Earth uh, so far is British Columbia, which is not that far from mm, you, really. Yeah, um, yeah I love it up there, Especially when you too. go further north, like north of uh, Vancouver and the like, where the people live. Um, it's just some of the most beautiful parts of the world I, I could ever imagine. Yeah. Well, so Washington state as well is fantastic. Like the Olympia peninsula, which mm -hmm. is just over from Canada. Like for anyone that doesn't know, I, uh, you can sort of go to the North end of, uh, Washington and it's just, you're just over the Bay from Vancouver Island. And, JJ. Uh, ooh, these two. Shout uh, out to JJ and, uh, Matt from, uh, useful charts who are from British Columbia. Yeah. No, it's great. They have a really good Asian uh, night market in uh, Vancouver. Because my oh, wife's yeah. Asian, before COVID times, we would drive up to Canada uh, two or three times a year to go to this Asian night market. Because really? you can, yes, I mean, it's like a six hour drive from Portland. So you can just get there in a day easy and stay for the weekend and come back. Did, ha um, 
so you've never been to Vietnam yet. So does she have no. relatives in Vietnam? Yeah, loads, dozens. Yeah. Wow, yeah. I, I hear that's a fun place to visit as well. It's like a, it's really up and coming these days. We definitely uh, were planning on going, but um, you this know. is sort of connected. Another major thing that America needs to improve on is uh, vacation times at work. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Well, don't have to worry about that now, but I guess she does. Or yeah, she not. still does. And I did when I started a job here. I only had two weeks off a year. People in Europe will be spitting out their espressos at that. Two weeks. Especially Italy. Or yeah, do they you're... get like six weeks in Italy or something? Uh, something like that. I mean, yeah. in England, the like it's it's got to be something like 26 days is the minimum. Something like that. Really? Yeah. Wow. So you just have way more time to travel. Honestly, loads more. I so, feel like this is turning into Bash America uh, stream. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is constructive criticism. It could just, imp I love America, but it really could improve that on uh, that, uh, that thing. Hey, it's useful chats. We have some celebrities in the chat, like true celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think it's your turn for the fourth question. Moving along. All right, let's uh, let's go back to talking about Kansas. Uh, let's say I'm a hot tamale. You see me walking down the road, and you're like, "Who's that? Where would you take me on a first date? What are we doing in your town? You've you've seduced me. What are we gonna do?" Oh wow! Okay, I am the least romantic person ever. You can ask Mrs. Beat about that. After all, again, I proposed to her in a Walmart, but <laughs> let's say, honestly, uh, there is this place. Um, it's called John Brown's Underground. Yeah. It's in Lawrence downtown, and it's named after the John Brown, who became infamous out here in Kansas. Uh, and it's known for their, like, their bartenders. They know their stuff, like the best cocktails in town. And it's mm -hmm. kind of... It's just a cool spot, kind of dark. Um, so that'd be a good kind of. Well, first you got to get dinner. Uh, they don't have food there. So, ah, oh, let's see, romantic. Uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what's that place? The Merchant downtown. Like they have. We usually don't go to fancy restaurants. That's the thing. Like that. I don't, and there's not really that many in my hometown. I mean, you know, like usually when people visit Lawrence, uh, I take them to my favorite pizza joint in town, which is Rudy's. Uh, <laughs> we can do so, that. I'm, 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 I like pizza. I'm yeah. So if that. you're ever here, I'll that's probably where I'll take it. it um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like, you know, the, I, I live close to the University of Kansas. Uh, I'm a big fan of college towns in general. And a big reason why is because the campus is like, it's a public space and they're usually immaculate. Like uh, if you look at a lot of college campuses, they're just beautiful. And University of Kansas is no exception. There's it's on a giant hill. And I would probably take um, I'd take you hot tamale there and watch the <laughs> sunset by the Campanile uh, on the hill. Like with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's where we what we watch fireworks there sometimes. It's kind of cool. But uh, fair enough. Yeah. That sounds OK. I'm just trying to get a picture question. of Midwest life, you know, because. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I, 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 there's a lot of interest from random people around the world because they're like, what's the real America? All I hear in the movie about in the movies is New York City or L.A. or maybe sure, Chicago. Yeah. So, yeah, like a lot of times they're like, oh, here's a guy from Kansas. And then I made this video comparing uh, Lawrence to another college town in the Midwest, Ames, Iowa. And uh, <laughs> it was. I got such random comments from um, like people from all over the world. I'm like, why are you watching this video? Why do yeah. you care about this? And I'm like, well, it's like kind of a cool to see a, this is like a snapshot of the country you don't get most other and most other media. So it's true. Yeah. I mean, like before I moved to America, my knowledge of anywhere outside of California, New York, and probably Texas. Yeah. It's Texas. pretty, it was pretty abysmal. And I, I, I take an interest in like history and geography, obviously, but we just don't, we don't know what's going down in Kansas. Like in Britain, we have no idea what's going down in Kansas. <laughs> That's well put in for Tiger. Sorry. Yeah. He, uh, 
actually doesn't live that far from we're probably about three hours apart so we we uh relate on that level (laughs) yeah so uh is it my turn yeah okay we always (laughs) i think i gotta ask you a i don't want to go there that's too dark um let's go with what type of non-history YouTube channels do you watch? And especially the weirder, the better. Well, I do watch way too many videos about pimple popping. That's for sure. <laughs> like, But I don't watch so many of those on YouTube, I would say. Only if it's like a really decent one would I watch it on YouTube. Normally that's an Instagram or TikTok sort of thing. Mm. Um weird youtube channels well i actually watch so i actually watch quite a bit of vietnamese youtube because it's just sort of on the tv here i'm going to share the screen here so we can so we can as you talk about them i want to look them up okay so yeah okay let me i'm trying to remember how so we can i I think maybe that's how you spell his name quai lang tran uh say again Kwai lang can you see the chat can you see the oh i'm sorry i'm not at the chat um okay so i'll just copy and paste it yeah i think Thank that's you. how you uh spell it uh it? it's none of those scroll <laughs> down scroll down maybe a little bit vietnamese channel yeah, it's a Vietnamese channel. Honestly, his videos are really, really good. Quai Lang. Huh. Let me see how am I spelling this. But this guy, uh, what's really big in Vietnamese uh, YouTube is food. And, um, okay, I totally butchered his name. That's why. Let me paste his. I got the link in the oh, chat. Okay. There you go. And so the Vietnamese are really big into food YouTube. And so this guy sort of travels Vietnam and not just Vietnam, all over Southeast Asia and uh, talks about the food and really like hangs out with the people who are producing the food. And he does put his videos with English subtitles. So anyone can watch along. Nice. And, And they're formatted properly. Like they're good subtitles. And uh, so this guy I watch, it really gives you a glimpse into life in uh, various Southeast Asia. Because I, yeah, we get so stuck on English YouTube, but YouTube isn't even just about English language. Like it's so, it's so crazy, the platform. It is. Like this is a big channel. Look at the views he gets. This is not a small yeah. YouTube channel. I had a wake and, up uh, call when I saw there was like a, a Mexican uh, channel I saw that had these type of views and it was similar. It was all in Spanish. It was all just like vlogging daily life. I don't remember the name of it, but yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, yeah okay. This, is this a... isn't weird though. We need weir- weirder than this. Weird. I don't know that I watched too many. I said, let me see. like, I'll tell you like okay, one of mine that, uh, I watched that it's weird. Um, New England wildlife and more. This guy, he, uh, oh, I'm not subscribed on this one. I'm, it's in my personal. Uh, so this guy just opens up old stuff, canned food. Uh, like I watched a video last night where, and, and Mrs. Beat introduced me to this guy, but last night I watched a video where he, uh, he popped 40 year old popcorn. Yeah. And it actually popped in the microwave. <laughs> <laughs> uh it's pretty amazing uh sometimes like he had a oh yeah like this eating 90 year old sometimes he eats it 90 what? year old vegetable soup i mean i suppose in theory hey, it's everyone. uh I think I have it's it's um still safe i suppose right if it's canned i don't know yeah and then i also got to give a shout out to uh scott man um for what's his oh okay scott man he he's from michigan so he has a lot of michigan videos but it's a travel there it is scott man 895 travel who uh it's like 
I told you how, you know, one thing I like about you and your channel is how authentic you are. I mean, it doesn't get more authentic than Scott, man. Like yeah. he, he just kind of tells you about like places that he visits and it's like anti-travel. I call it that, that a genre like anti, like everything the tra travel channel would not want you to do. Like close-ups of the wrong things, you know, like hearing him, <laughs> you hear like disgusting sounds he makes when he eats sometimes, but I still love it. <laughs> it's real. It is real. Yeah. So, anyway, I always sneak him into my videos, by the way. I always sneak him on like in little, if you can catch it. Scottman 895. I've been to the Czech Republic just two weeks ago. Good for him. Holy cat. crap. Yeah. Frog. Travel guide. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the last thing. Like... Any weird? What about a weird genre that you like? So I don't know that I have a weird genre. Honestly, I like I like, I watch like videos about photography. Um, I like to watch videos about geography. About I'm. Uh, I don't feel like I have any weird tastes. I don't know. I'm so boring. <laughs> It's I, I mean, I guess my my filthy habit is pimple popping. Like I will, I will sit back and watch those, no problem. I'm sure these have more views than we do on our channel. Oh wow! Yeah, just stuff like that. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, uh... I will. I've already seen all of those. Like I already know exactly <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> yeah like sometimes i'll see a video with the spot and i'll be like oh, i've seen that spot before i'll watch a different one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah you you weren't joking um yeah well i kind of get i kind of get some of that stuff because like you know it's weird it, it's like asmr type stuff you know like yeah. something about like it's extremely satisfying to relieving see pressure mm. <laughs> and just like the girl that sells farts, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, just something like mindless about it. Like it's, you don't have to think about it, but it's also satisfying. I wonder if just there's a farting channel. Dream Somebody dream. that just sits there and farts like and see and records it. There was a guy that recorded his farts, but got fired from his job. Did you see that? It's, no. it's a couple of years ago now. Was, he was a security guard. And every time he needed to fart, he would just pull his camera out and fart and put it away. And then uh, his boss fired him for farting on camera at his job. What? Why does it matter? It's a stupid reason know. to get fired. Yeah. <laughs> but now he's making it big. With the well, I don't know. I don't know what happened to him. Internet Hopefully. fame can be fleeting. Pretty fleeting. Yeah, true that. Hopefully there was a happy ending. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, your turn then. Yeah. Uh... Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Let me We're see. Done. How do you how do you decide a video topic? Is there anything you ask yourself to decide what's a good or bad topic? Because I, I ask that because now I ask myself prompts. So I, I can and talk about mine after maybe, but I just wonder what your process is. That's related to one of my questions I had for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I uh it used to be different. It used to be when I, you know, when I started out, it was mostly curriculum based. You know, I would, I would search for a video that was something that we had to teach in the classroom. And if it didn't exist, then I'm like, oh, I should really make that. Like, I remember searching for the Texas revolution in 2013, I think it was, or no, it was 2012. Like no one's made a video about this. And so I was like the first one. And that's why I got so many views, even though it was a horrible video. Um, and then later, like I would say, uh, like fast forward to today, I do listen a lot to my audience more than I've ever listened, especially for the compared series. Like mm -hmm. um, I'm always putting polls out there. Um, like it looks like Iowa and Nebraska are getting compared based on. <laughs> I voted for Nebraska. Yeah, I think I saw that poll. Yeah. Um, so that's because they're both a... we're, they're both the corn states. We want to see how these corn rivals <laughs> stack up. Yeah, yeah, all about the corn, baby. Um, oh, I got to make that engaging somehow. Um, no, uh, the other third is curiosity, but also, yeah, I mean, I have a spreadsheet of video ideas that's ridiculously long. It's hundreds and hundreds. Um, and so I always have a kind of like an idea, but I'm keeping my eye on current events, you know, and trends and, like, you know, like when 
it the pandemic broke out and I can kind of see what was going on with that. Like, or, oh, a better, even better example, because this is more recent, is the, um, well, the pandemic is pretty recent, but um, the <laughs> making of a uh, Supreme Court case about abortion, um, you know, uh, KCV Planned Parenthood, because I knew that they were going to be looking at that case and they might be overturning it here yeah. very soon. And uh, so that's why. So, you know, some of it's current events, but, you know, we all as YouTube content creators, we know how it you just don't know sometimes what's going to like I made this purple light video. I had a feeling it might do well, but it just blew up. And I was like, I don't understand why. Like, it's not purple even light. Good. Yeah. Like there's purple street lights in uh, certain spots in oh, the country. Not I Oregon. Saw... You guys are all like, advanced out there. But uh, the it's a it's a flaw actually the the uh the lights are not supposed to do that but then i found out apparently there's conspiracy theories already about that like that oh it's so they can see your veins and tell if you're vaccinated or not or, i don't know <laughs> but no it's not like it, a blue light yeah they can see if they've you've washed your undies or not. <laughs> i mean yeah no, I, it was just my own curiosity and i was like oh you know people might be searching for this anyway and um so yeah, like if I'm making a video though, more and more, especially the older I get, you know, I it, I have to be into it. I will yeah. not make it. And lately, to be frank, um, I've been more into the the music videos. Like I'm I'm currently making a video about Led Zeppelin. I'm so into it. Like I love yeah. making the history of bands. Um, so maybe someday I'll only be making those and I'm, I'm sorry, but I'll get just sick of making president videos. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. That's, that's understandable for sure. That's yeah. why, uh, it helps to have our channels as our names, at least, even if we are in theory focused on one genre, we can switch every, any time, you know, we're not like geography now, for example. Uh, yeah, I wonder what he's going to do when he's done with countries, if he's going to just retire the channel <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know yeah and yeah i don't know have you seen that beatles documentary on uh, disney uh no um i already made a documentary that's good enough so <laughs> why don't you we should check it's so interesting man it's so interesting i heard it's good yeah yeah it's a uh, it's a real guilty no, it's not a guilty pleasure. I don't know why I was going to say that. I think it's uh, it's great. It's really interesting to see behind the scenes this candid conversation of a band making an album, especially one as famous as the Beatles. And mm -hmm. so, like, they like rigged this whole building up with microphones and cameras, so you r really get this. You really see the Beatles like talking about their life and the album. It's it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Led Zeppelin had a, you know, I was watching their documentary, um, The Song Remains the Same. It's mostly just a concert documentary, and I was kind of hoping to hear more from them, and I was a little disappointed. But yeah, it is kind of cool, to, like, just to get those boring moments. Like, uh, I made another video about Pixies, you know, the band The Pixies. Yeah. Uh, of course you do. Yes, you're, you're hip. You're in Portland. <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, they, there was a great documentary about them, too, when they were getting back together after, um, like a 10 year hiatus or whatever it was. And that, yeah, that, I, I imagine that was similar because it was usually musicians, you don't get an unfiltered look at them. It's just usually you just get the songs. And even when they're on stage, they don't say much between songs, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> but it was so interesting. Do you mind if I reveal a little spoiler from it? Oh, go ahead. It was so interesting seeing the Beatles um, because they were talking about their head. They were sat, sat around reading the newspaper um, and they were sort of gossiping about the future of the Beatles. And you can see whilst they're in the process of making this album that they've just sort of drifted apart. You know, they're, right. they're not like teenage. They started the Beatles when they were teenagers and now they're grown up a bit and they just have their own ideas about things. And And they were joking when they're reading this tabloid, like, oh, in 50 years, everyone's going to blame Yoko for breaking up the Beatles. And that's exactly what happened. And they were joking Whoa. about that at the time. <laughs> John was probably the one that drifted apart more than any of them. Yeah, well, yeah, it's int like, yeah, it's you'll have to check it out. It's it's well worth a watch. It's so interesting. 
All right. to see that. I already took your other recommendations that you said the that wacky show British. Uh, uh, what was his name? Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Yeah, I could. I can't believe that it was actually on Prime. I'm like, oh my gosh, and it's so weird. I loved it. Yeah, that's so ridiculous. I love anything with um, oh, what's his name in from Moss from It Crowd. What's his name again? I forget. With the crazy hair, yeah, he was great. Yeah, he's terrific. What's his name? Richard Iwade. That's it. How could I forget? Yeah, it's kind of a weird name. Yeah. Um. All right. My well, related to your question is, um, you know, actually, this is from Pat Kelly. So shout out to Pat Kelly, another edgy tuber. Shout out. He saw that we were doing this on Instagram, and he's like, you know, one time I saw a post-it note that Stefan had on his desk or something computer that said uh, banger. Like it's a banger. That means you need to make it like the video will be a banger. Yeah. Um, so as far as your criteria, so as far as what, what type of video you want to make. And so, yeah, that, what is, what does a banger video look like? How do you know it's a banger? I suppose it's just like an emotional reaction. You know, is it a banger? I ask myself, I have it on a post-it note right behind this computer that I'm looking at now. Is it a banger? Because I want to ask myself, is this like the biggest way I could tell this story? Or is it the most exciting way I could tell this story? Is it something that I just have a casual interest in? Or am I really passionate about it? Um, am I just making it because I feel I need to make a video or am I truly passionate about it? So, mm -hmm. I mean, is it a banger? It's just like British slang for saying like, is this like really good? Is it a banger? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, what a boring answer. No, <laughs> yeah. no I mean, but so, I know what you're saying like uh, it, I, when I, I did a, actually when I was in grad school, I did a paper on why things go viral, like particularly in media and it did help me with my channel eventually. And um, I turned it into a video and the video is called why this video will not go viral. Cause like mm. so the, one of the, the big things is it has to be something that gets you um, either angry um, or um, just uh, I guess angry or like fired up about how like, I guess how I was getting earlier about healthcare when I was talking about healthcare, mm -hmm. if a, like if a video gets you fired up like that, then it will go viral. Like, um, and that's why social media is so rotten is because that's the only stuff. And most of the time it's stuff that's counterproductive that it just, uh, emotional, uh, garbage. Basically we're just getting angry at each other or, um, what was the term that he used? I forgot the term that he used. Somebody in the chat, Aaron said strong emotions, but there was like a term for it. Provocative? I don't know. That might, yeah, he didn't use that language that I read a book that the book was called Contagion by. Uh, I mean, that that's another sticky note I have on my wall. I have four sticky notes. Is it a banger? Clickable, spark curiosity, and emotion. Those are the four sticky notes I have on my wall. And that's not to, and I don't have them there because I want to become like some factory just churning out, uh, you know, whatever. It's just to ask myself, is it the, like, I'm, am I interested in this topic truly? And if I am, what is the biggest and best way I can, I can present it? Because I, I, I kind of feel like all videos, all my videos take a long time now, no matter how small my intentions are. So That's understandable. Well just, yeah. Your production value has gone way up. Oh, it's incredible. Like I've really tried to increase my production value for sure. And uh, yeah, it takes a long time to produce a video now. So with that comes, if it's going to take me a long video, no matter a long time, no matter what it is, then I've got to make sure that I'm really. Um, creating a video that's exciting to me. Yeah. You know, it's got to be a banger. Only bangers. 2022 is the, the year of time, only bangers. You and I have to pay the bills. So you're, that's the thing that's so troubling, especially with political pundits. And like, because they want to produce content that the, their audience will like. And I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, it, that's what's so troublesome about 
political pundits in general, like they're, they're in some ways they're slaves to their audience. And yeah. I, I am that way when it comes to like, I find myself like, I got to make a president video. It's been, oh no, it's been, it's been a month since I made a president video. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I say that and I still love making them, you know, so that's how I justify it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, like I told you, I'm making a just quick video asking questions of people who believe in this idea about ancient Egypt. And uh, in that one, if it's just a short video like that, and I'm really mm -hmm. making it spontaneous, then I try and lean into the fun of it. And I've gone like, I've gone w silly with the editing. They're like tigers walking across the screen randomly. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> nice. like, I, I, like if it's going to be a silly quick video, then like really, you might as well have fun. Um, I find, yeah, some video content producers like they put so much planning into it, and so much of it for me is just like spontaneous on, on the cuff. Like as a, oh, I just throw that in there. Why not? And is that how you are when you edit videos? You're just like, I'm just gonna throw that in there and not think that well, much about it. It depends because now I'm thinking a lot more because um, I I commission a lot of artwork for the videos. And so if I want to produce videos on any reasonable schedule, I have to think long in advance about um, the artwork that's being produced. Like at the minute, I'm trying to work out the artwork for my videos in towards the end of February and March. Mm. That's how far ahead I have to plan. Wow. So, and because I've invested money in the artwork, I have to make the topic kind of, otherwise I've really just sunk money. Um, although sometimes I have commissioned artwork and then I've just thought like, you know what, this video, it doesn't interest me. I'm going to come back to it another time. Um, so I, I do have artwork for videos that were never made. But as I want to increase the amount of artwork in my videos and use it to its like fullest potential, I have mm -hmm. to think more. So I think my I think there's going to be like two levels of content like higher produced videos and I can't do any more than one a month of those. It's just not possible. And, uh, and then an odd quick video is something like really immediately takes my fancy, but yeah. I feel like good quality videos, they never go out of style. And That's I've, true. and I've made videos. I feel like sooner, or, I do kind of feel like sooner or later the algorithm picks them up. Like the algorithm does want me to be successful. Ultimately, it wants me to succeed because that's just more ad revenue for YouTube. It's so funny. So, the way you're talking about it, it seems like it's like God or something, you know. Really, I know, it is. Algorithm <laughs> gods, but like... The algorithm wants me to succeed. It is a benevolent God Lord. To <laughs> uh, I just gotta, you know, stay true to his, uh, his word, the algorithm's word, and everything will turn yeah. out okay well that's and why pray. i try and th that's why i've tried to increase production value because i can't drum up enthusiasm for a topic that might be more um topical maybe i just can't be bothered to make a video i'm not interested in mm -hmm. so the only way i can increase my chances in the algorithm is production value i would say that's and true. and really narrow down like i said like what is the like, so I've thought of this idea. What is the best possible version of that idea? What's what's the most I could make from it? What's the biggest I could go? So you don't really so, focus as much on thumbnails then, do you? Well, I'm just not good at it. I, <laughs> I, I always use the artwork for a thumbnail. I don't think I can do any better than the artwork for that I commissioned for the videos. So... Um, it just depends. It, re it really just depends. And sometimes videos feed off one another. Like uh, I, I, we've been talking about, I know me and you could talk about this all day because this is what we do. I don't know how much yeah, sure your viewership is declining. <laughs> but but yeah. videos like feed off one another. I made a video about the Vikings, the furthest possible like Viking uh, trip that might have been the Azores. And I released that video and I did and it did really well because I guess it sparked curiosity as one of my notes would say like, huh, what is the furthest the Vikings sailed? And then like the week after that one took off an older video on the Roman Empire's furthest outpost doubled in views because I guess people were going from one to the other. Mm. So like good, like, like, it's, like I just focus on making the best video I can. 
and uh, and I and I think it pays off ultimately. Yeah, I think generally that's the case too. I think, which uh, we're all looking for shortcuts, especially folks starting out. So that's I just... know. It never. If I was starting my YouTube channel now, I would say to them, don't don't even sweat like a schedule. Try and make a video like once a month, but just make a great best video you can. Patience. Yeah. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, you've got 12 great videos that your audience is going to love and that you'll, that, that, that would, people are going to watch and think, wow, I need to, like, I want to, I want people to feel excited when they see that I've uploaded. That's what I want to, that's the emotion I want to create in people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I could talk about that forever. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, we're boring the audience now. So, but yeah, I think it's your turn. What, what's your next question? Uh, should I just pick anyone? Yeah. Is the Republican Party a threat to the Republic? Ooh, to it, democracy. A, I like how you worded that question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think parts of it are for sure. I mean, the... I think I've voted for Republicans throughout my life, um, but it seems like the party there's, and it's mostly related to, to Trump, of course, but I, it's not all him because now some are turning on him, but it's like the, they're just, they're not in the same reality as um, most of us. Like they, seems like they've left reality. Honestly. Yeah. It seems and like. It, I love a good debate if you can be in the same reality, but if you can't even be in the same reality, like I get some of these responses on my Twitter too. I'm just like, you know, if you think that the, um, the vaccine is, you know, like injecting something into us, that's going to make us die within a year or something. I, I can't even have a conversation with you. Uh, I, I feel like it's, it's like, the, I know this sounds really bad, but <laughs> It's like me talking to someone who is has a mental illness or who is it does like feel a, like that emotionally it does stunted feel like that. or dementia or something like you know it's like I'm sorry I can't we can't even engage but I love to engage with people that disagree with me like the classic debate of um, the role of government in society is terrific and I in my classroom I had these all the time and almost all my students were able to critically think about things and always like prime example is um the uh, every time we did debates about either the like in my economics class i taught uh, minimum wage we had such rich discussions there the students all critically thought about it and um i feel like i'm always going back and forth on that issue um but like with with some of the, the like a certain section of the republican party now it's like it's so far gone that I, and I know this sounds horrible, but I just, I'm nostalgic for the old Republican party. And when I say old Republican party, even like someone like Mitt Romney in 2012, like um, even if I disagreed with them on certain things, like you could still uh, understand where they're coming from, you know? Yeah, no, I absolutely. Like I mean, I've never been, uh, I mean, I, you know, I haven't lived in America a super long time. So Oh, that's right. But, How long have you been here? Uh, five, five years. Okay. Six years. I arrived long. just before Trump got elected. Perfect timing. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I just caught the last few months of Obama, and then uh, then it was the Trump presidency. But it's been all uphill ever since. Yeah, we've been, gone up. <laughs> yeah. So it was a great time to land. Uh, but, but, you know, I moved to Portland, Oregon, so where the Republican Party is not popular and its chances of achieving power in Portland, Oregon are basically an absolute flat zero. So I do wonder, you know, how other parts of America think because I'm very much not in that world. You're in a bubble. We all, yeah. most of us are. I, that's what I kind of like about living here is that I, I'm constantly interacting with people that disagree with me and that's good. <laughs> yeah. It's really good. But, but I asked you that question because it, it's, it seems like a lot of them aren't interested in the system of the Republic anymore. You know, it seems like they've given up on it a little bit. They're they're out for like revolution almost. 
And yeah, yeah they're I mean, like the, the corporate. The 2020 election was a in January 6th, like yesterday was the anniversary. That, that was a turning point for me. Like I used to, I remember the first year of Trump's presidency. I was um, some of more, my more left leaning friends. I was defending Trump to them, and they were chewing me out. They were pretty harsh, and they like I was like, give him a chance. You know, it's kind of good to have somewhat of an outsider in there. And uh, but then I flash forward four years later, and it's like my perception of him changed quite a bit. You know, and it really wears on you. It was to a point yeah. where, because I, you know, I am not somebody that is a lifelong Democrat, and I've always been pretty independent minded and um, I, you know, I'm not a fan of <laughs> most of the mainstream democratic politicians. I'm happy that Nancy Pelosi is stepping down. That was really good news to me. But at the same time, I think of the alternative and I'm wondering like, which direction is the Republican party going to go? Cause it, it, you see someone, someone like uh, Marjorie Taylor green, is that her name? Like, yeah. If that's the future of the Republican She's wacko. Party, they're She's doomed. absolutely wacko. They, they can't win that way the, unless they literally just get rid of democracy um, because they don't have the numbers. And the other crazy thing right now is they're killing themselves. Like the the highest rate of death um, in the country right now is is very Republican counties. And it's really sad to see, like, because uh, I, I, I see it near here. I'm, I'm like, you they're not getting vaccinated still. They're mm. still not getting vaccinated. And I'm like, I don't know if you're like, it's a self-destruction is what it is. And they don't even see it. Yeah. So. It's a, well, but I mean, this is, maybe they do see it. They seem to be putting a lot of their focus into redrawing electoral boundaries. That seems to be the uh, <laughs> order of the day. That started in 2010 though. And they, the thing is now the backlash Democrats are getting pretty good at gerrymandering too. And <laughs> the only thing I'm worried about is like the uh, secretary of States. Like, you know, we had some with integrity Republicans and they're now they're saying, well, no, no matter what, if the Republican candidate loses, then you got to overturn it. And so we'll see if, you know, the corruption. The next happened. election is going to be uh, an interesting one. For sure. So I'm apprehensive for it, honestly. You know, it's funny because Biden has such a low approval rating, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that like everyone's going to flock to the Republican Party. I think everyone's just desperate for something different. Um, yeah. So that that's yeah, like because you'll see like a lot of if you ask a lot of people who talk trash about Biden, they're like, "Well, would you go back to Trump?" And like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, so I, I think I think it'd be cool if in 2024 we finally had that legitimate third option so i think i don't know if there'll be a third option but i think uh i personally think i don't know how true this is this is just it's just an idea i have and remember i do live in the very uh left leaning portland oregon bubble but i i do kind of feel like a lot of people in america now because of the internet they know that a lot of the rest of the world, I feel like people have more for working less. Americans are overworked, and yeah. for the amount of work they get, they don't get health care. They don't get vacations. Their kids go to underfunded schools. And before, maybe people, I, people didn't realize how other places in the world worked. Not that they're perfect by any means. I don't want to present, you know, people always point to Europe, and, and Europe has plenty of its own problems but to go back to those two points i mentioned earlier two things i didn't worry about in britain was uh you know my health care if i lost my job do i lose my health care um and you know being able to have some time off work and like plan to do something fun at some point in my life you know <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. a lot of, but a lot of americans you see them on the internet they're working long hours long long hours and they're not getting much for that labor really they think they are though don't they they it's a part of our culture is like we we're work i'm a workaholic still like i get up at six every morning and i'm like i'm gonna, i feel guilty if i don't get stuff done and i wonder where that yeah. comes from part of it comes from my mom but other is like yeah our culture is like you you're a bum if you're not working all the time so. yeah and and i i hate to like bash on america because i do love it here so i don't want anyone to get it twisted but i just want it to be the best version of itself 
I didn't, I want to <laughs> I want to ask America, is it a banger? That's what I want to ask America. <laughs> yeah. Um. I think it's my turn, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh. Well, I, I'll. Uh. Yeah. Like, I guess this is related to what we're talking about. Um. How has your life changed since becoming a father? You've been a father almost two years now. Like, what? What? It's open ended on purpose. So, go, whatever direction you want to go. <laughs> uh. I mean, ultimately. It's great. I wish I knew how much I'd enjoy being a father uh, 10 years ago. You know, maybe I've had 10, 15 kids by now. I don't know. But uh, no, no. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really. No, it's uh, it's brilliant. It's given my uh, getting married and becoming a father has given my life so much more uh, purpose. Um, it's just uh, and. and it's just filled my life with so much happiness. Like I love hanging out with my daughter and playing with her and, and seeing her learn new things. She's already like bilingual, which is crazy. She can speak English and Vietnamese basically equally well, Jeez, which is, in, yeah. Cause she, uh, she switches between the two all day and you know, she's not, not a single day in her life has gone by where she hasn't heard Vietnamese and English. Do you speak Vietnamese? I uh, speak a little bit. I've I've learned some key phrases. I can understand a little bit. So your toddler can speak better Vietnamese than you, is what you're saying? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, I learn Vietnamese through her. But um, <laughs> no, it's just uh, it's just I actually this last year during COVID, I wrote a book that's going to be published. I got it right here. Whoa! Tales of Ancient Worlds. Oh, I think I remember you posting something about that. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's Coming amazing. to a shop near you. And um, I basically entirely wrote the books because I wanted to write something for my daughter. And uh, I think it's really impossible. I think it's really important to show kids like what is, you know, possible. The sort of the environment that they're raised in really, I think, affects their perception of what is or isn't possible in their life and the people that they're around. And uh, so if you're a bum, you don't get to hang out with my daughter. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. But uh, and I basically agreed to the whole thing, just not because I had any ambitions of being an author, but just so I could uh, dedicate it to my daughter. And awesome. it's so it's so great, man. It's so great. If you're listening to this thing and should i have a kid go for it absolutely do it right now and uh, our audience definitely needs to have kids we need <laughs> yeah <laughs> reproduce yeah go forth and uh, multiply sow your oats as my grandma would say and um no it's it's the best i actually have another child on the way number two's already on the way whoa i well, know congratulations i didn't Thank know that. you yeah yeah no, breaking uh, news <laughs> breaking news i haven't shared that publicly uh so yeah that's gonna be that's gonna be even more fantastic but i don't know if i'll have more than two that seems like a lot of work i mean you have two daughters so yes. probably it is a lot of work they're 10 and 7 now so they're a lot of like when they were little i didn't produce much content yeah um, no, it's hard it's hard man. yeah <laughs> So many uh, videos of mine have to be interrupted because I have to go make chicken nuggets or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah. yeah, but I'm very well, lucky that uh, my mother-in-law lives just down the road and yeah. uh, looks after her every day, so we don't have to pay for childcare. So I'm extremely fortunate. And me and my wife both work at home. She's just in the room next to me. Uh, even though she's a nurse, she's got like a, a, a at home position at the minute. So we're great. We're like one little happy family. We're all at home together all day. It's a, uh, it's fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I had a really big life changing experience with that April, 2020. Um, when I, I haven't really said this before, but like on, a, on my channel, but, um, I was not sleeping enough for about 10 years, like including when my daughters were younger, um, which is, uh, as you know, that's understandable, but yeah. I was sleeping about five hours a night and I just thought that was normal. Like I was, uh, you know, uh, teaching during the day, making videos at night. And 
during the lockdown in last April, it was the first time in more than 10 years, probably 11 or 12 years that I was getting a full night's sleep. And also, um, just spending quality time with my daughters. Yeah. So I was like, it wasn't just like, you know, like you're in the room. Uh, and so that was, uh, like we would go out hiking together, for example. Yeah. And, uh, so that was, uh, kind of the, one of the catalysts for me, like saying, I'm just going to go full time with this, what I, you know, I'm, uh, so yeah, like that's one of the benefits now is that I do see my daughters more. I get to take them to school in the morning and bring them home and even little things like that. Like, you know, right now they're of course on their tablets. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad parent now, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I, you know, it's so critical because I, I think so many kids are not, their parents aren't in the picture. And it's because of, like we said earlier, they're working all the freaking time yeah, just to survive. Both parents are working too. Like, remember I, I, there was a time in my life where my mom stayed home and it used to, it was more common for one parent to stay home at least. Um, you know, it's just not the case anymore. Like both parents are working, not just yeah. the United States, that's all over the world. Yeah, it's true for sure. <laughs> Britain's the same. I asked my dad when I was back in Britain. Uh... Sorry. <laughs> Go, finish your thought. Finish your thought. No, I asked my dad about like his views on, you know, we uh, took my daughter back to Britain after almost two years because of COVID. Just sadly, my parents had been unable to visit us and we had been able, unable to visit them. Oh, so it was our first trip back home. Yeah, it, was, it sucked the whole year. But we had a great time when we were over there. We went for three weeks. It was great. But I, again, yeah, like you said, I asked my dad about, you know, Zoe compared to me and as a, when I was a child. And, you know, he was like, honestly, I was at work all day. You know, he would... Yeah, he, like he would only hang out with me on the on the weekends. He didn't get to like the amount of time I get to spend with my daughter is huge compared to like basically everyone in my dad's generation. They just mm -hmm. had to go to work. There's no record, no, nothing else they could do, which is kind of a. It's a it's lucky. I should just think of it as I'm very lucky. Well, the other thing I'm very I happy. Yeah, like we, we can be more efficient when you work from home too. Like you get done what you need to in a sh shockingly less time. Like, you know, and you don't have to drive somewhere. All the time I was yeah. saving teaching online and I was like, why are we doing all these things, wasting time? And, and we're away from our families. Yeah. There are so many jobs that could be done remotely. It's, uh, I think, I think teaching, I suppose, will go back to the classroom full time eventually because. Oh, it already is, but. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there's a book I want to recommend called, well, BS Jobs. But yeah, that's uh, check it out. Um, yeah. And then my favorite Beatle is probably Paul McCartney. I've said this before. What about you? <laughs> now, after watching that documentary, it's got to be Ringo. Oh, documentary change. <laughs> <Like, laughs> all these guys, they're just like writing the songs and debating it. And it cuts to Ringo and he's always just doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the happiest. like he's just waiting to start drumming again <laughs> again you know yeah we all want to be ringo right yeah 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 no it's it's really funny i he seems like a really funny guy ringo the other the other guys you know they're clearly getting frustrated that they're like artistic visions are not being fully realized yeah yeah and ringo is just like chilling out in the background Along like, for the uh, ride, just happy to be there. Yeah, yeah, Such, I'm just so happy. funny. That's like <laughs> yeah. the whole trope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you wouldn't even believe how much toast they eat. I don't know if it's because this is 1967 and they don't have as wide a range of snacks, <laughs> but like <laughs> they're only eating toast. Like it cuts to them, and all they're eating is toast. Huh. Like I've this camera crew has been following them all day for two weeks at the point where i am in the story and i've only ever seen them eat one thing that wasn't toast in two weeks just like okay. toast and tea all day toast and tea toast and I'm tea okay with that. i'm okay with toast and tea all day yeah yeah <laughs> it's funny. all right uh it's your turn my turn my turn my turn my turn i did have a, a question for you as a father Oh. Do you do you ever 
as a father and someone that's on social media, how do you approach your talk to your kids if they want to be like active on social media? Are you ever concerned about that or what Greatly. are your views on that? Yeah. It worries me. <laughs> yeah. I've seen the the research on it so far, a lot well, some of it, and it's not positive. And so I've uh, I've already told my daughters and like I don't want you getting social media until at least high school because you can't handle it. Middle school is so such a time of you know, where especially with girls, like where they're vicious to each other and they don't even realize how vicious they're being. Like I've seen yeah. it first thing. I used to teach seventh grade, I saw it all the time. And you know, uh they both have YouTube channels that said, but it's, it's not, um, it's not, it's protected. It's like, um, so hardly anybody can really see it. Um, mm -hmm. and they can't get comments. So, and I think social media, like the commenters right now, you in the comment section and the chat, that is social media. So the comment section of YouTube is social media. So, um, and some of you are horrible to each other. Let's face it. Uh, I see it on and to my us. <laughs> Yeah, and us. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's, I'm pretty um, numb to it. I'm sure you are too at this point. Um, I, it affects me, honestly, man. It affects me. I don't read. It. It? Like, if you're one of my viewers, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy my videos and I appreciate it. But after the video's been out for one day, I stop checking comments. Well, see, but that's it. That like after one day, that's when you start to get people that aren't your regular viewers watching. When the it, yeah. when it starts adjusting it to non-subscribers, yeah. So. That's so I have the same policy. Um, I do, I guess, get a little worked up when I see regular viewers like strongly criticizing me. But mm -hmm. generally, I know it's coming from a good place, and they're usually respectful. And but you know, like my George Soros video, like you sh you should see how horrific some of those comments are. Like I can only but imagine. I, don't, I leave them. I f I don't filter it. Like if sometimes YouTube censors them and I uncensor it. I like no. Nah, let let the world know how much of a jerk you are. I want the world to know. I want the FBI to see it. I want everybody to see uh, your IP address, where you posted it from, and how rotten you you, you are as a human yeah. being and at this stage in your life. Because I'm sure you used to be wonderful. You used to be a baby and adorable, and I would have held you and like, oh, you're so cute. But now you're you're saying that I'm uh, Satan. Uh, but maybe later in life, you're not going to think I'm Satan and we can sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about how much we love to watch, you know, baseball. I don't know. Yeah. So like, you know, people are in some dark places and I think young kids in particular, like, you know, my, my 10 year old, she, she would not be able to handle that because she doesn't have that perspective. And so, yeah, maybe I'm a strict jerk for not letting them be on social media until, do they want to be on like Instagram and all of that stuff? I take it, especially Instagram. That's the worst because they're you're constantly comparing yourself to other people, and all of it's fake. Like everyone's using filters, and it's not how they really look. And uh, even what Hollywood movies are all fake. Like they they make them all look ha like they have better skin than they do, or they have mm -hmm. more like de age them. Yeah, yeah. So it's all fake. I, I think that's one appealing thing about YouTube. It's like a lot of times you're you're getting a real deal still and so i let them watch youtube they watch their favorite channel is mariah elizabeth they watch that every friday she releases a video i release and a video every friday, friday they watch it yeah they don't watch my videos every friday they watch hers so. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, yeah so i don't have any other questions related to that type of stuff. So there's no segue. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, I, I worry. I think about it, though. I think about it. It's hard. I'm so oh, yeah. thankful yeah. that my childhood wasn't filmed. Well, like the amount of stupid stuff I did and the amount of stupid stuff I said that is now well, just yeah. lost to history. And if it was oh. filmed, uh, you know, it's hard to let that stuff go. It's hard. Are you going to let them be on social media when they're in high school or? Do you have like a do you have an age in mind or I suppose at high school I would because the flip side of it is you don't want them to be an outcast of their friend group, which is the other, you know, you they need to do you need to let them do things, I suppose, that their peer group are doing. That's a good and, point. And um but I yeah, I think like you, I wouldn't let them before high school. Yeah. I think I think, I think that's a it's an, an impossible 
impossible to get the balance right, but I think that's as, as close as you can get, I think, yeah. It's tough. <laughs> but, I, you know, kids these days can handle more. They're desensitized, so maybe we, we are being a little bit... Because I, I can tell you, like, so many of my viewers lie about their age, and, you know, they're not 13. They're, mm -hmm. I get a lot of younger viewers. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. But I can tell from my Discord server, like, I feel like sometimes... Uh, Mrs. Beat and I are like the the parents on there, you know. We're like, <laughs> yeah. I got I I connected to social media, man. I don't know. I I really like that kind of stuff affects me. Like, I really I'm of the opinion I will never open a Discord and stuff because it takes a lot of mental energy for me to see these conversations all the time and to moderate these things all the time. Does it? Do you find that it takes a lot of your energy, a lot of your time? It could, but I, I don't get on very much. I rely on other people. Yeah. Um, I actually have former students that help me run it, and one of, one of them actually talked me into starting it. And yeah, but that helps. But you just find some good people you can trust to moderate, and you have some pretty strict rules yeah. up front. Just like running a classroom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. All right. Segway, uh, segue wildly onto the next goes, question. Yeah, we're gonna go to your sp specific genre here. Like, you know, I one of my favorite movies growing up was Encino Man. So, <laughs> Man. so I if they, seen that. I don't know what that is. Oh crap! Okay, well, the general, it's a it's a cave dude, you know, a pa Paleolithic person that is frozen, and uh, he's thawed out. They find him when they're digging a the pool and. Encino oh, California. I have. I think that does bring back memories. I think I'm I have probably sure. seen that. Yeah, yeah. Holy Shore, who's a wh horrible actor, by the way. Um, <laughs> but I like the movie still. But yeah, like, like if if that the premise of that movie really did happen, like if a Paleolithic period person that was frozen woke up today, based on your knowledge, how would they actually handle everything today? What do you think they would do? So they're an adult. They're not just like a child yeah. plucked from the Paleolithic. Hmm. Yep. So like Brendan Fraser, twenty something dude. Tough to say. Tough to say. I think ultimately they would adapt. Uh, I think humans are incredibly flexible. Ultimately, mm -hmm. that is our. If our def if we have one defining characteristic, I think it's our ability to adjust and, and adapt and improvise. Um. But man, that would be an absolute trip for them. Jesus. <laughs> uh, like they, I, it would be so interesting to see how they conceived of the world before absolutely any of the trappings of modern civilization, you know. Uh, so who even knows? Like, well, in the movie, he thought like the garbage truck was an animal and he attacked it with something that he thought would be closest resembling a spear. Yeah. Would, was that realistic? I mean, I don't I, know. Like, I don't know. I mean, he's only, they would have only ever seen animals. Um, they would have never even seen like a house or anything. Um, maybe get claustrophobic, maybe like, maybe I wonder, I wonder if it would, would might be so like stimulating. We so have so much visual stimulation around us now. Kind of like the equivalent of uh, tripping on acid or something. Maybe, yeah, yeah. Who knows what they would, what they yeah. would do? They did do this series back in the day on the BBC where they took people from uh, one of the islands around Papua New Guinea and brought them to London for a bit. And uh, but they didn't bring them on their own. There was like a gang of four or five that came, and they. Seems like they thought it was hilarious, like all the stuff. They thought it was absolutely wild. But but even someone from like a remote part of Papua New Guinea still has a much better concept of how the world works now than like someone from the Paleolithic. So so mm -hmm. who even knows? Like ultimately they would adapt, but I don't know. We have so many like ideas now, so many religions. Like, what would we even show the guy? Like all the different religions would compete for him. You'd have to start with communication first, right? Like somehow yeah, we'd have to... teach them how to communicate. Yeah, build up a language, shared language together. 
It'd be crazy. It'd be wild. Somewhere out there, I do believe, you know, in as in uh, Siberia, they often pull out, I say often, not super often, but occasionally find um, like preserved mammoths and woolly rhinos and things like that in the permafrost. Have you seen those? Uh, yeah, I have. Somewhere in Siberia, there, there is a fully preserved human, I'm sure. I'm sure. You really think so? Yeah, 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 for sure. Why would all these animals be preserved and not a human? Especially considering we have like um, a desire to uh, treat the dead uh, in a special way, you know, through burials and such. Um, it's a, I think somewhere out there, who knows if we'll ever find them? Because once they start like uh, defrosting, you've got to find them really quick. Otherwise, they just immediately like rot. So it's not necessarily true that we'll find that guy. But there, <laughs> there, are, there are people like truly frozen from the Paleolithic out there in Siberia. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Yeah, I, I never even thought about that. But yeah, I guess with the woolly mammoths, the, I guess that's the best way to preserve stuff, right? <laughs> Yeah, there's somewhere there's I'm just a guy like in the ice in Russia somewhere. Like they, yeah. they're out there. <laughs> but they're definitely not gonna be able to be brought back to life. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> they're for sure long dead. <laughs> <laughs> just to be able to see though the it like fully yeah. formed. That that's yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting. I, and to I always see think about clothes. like thousands of years in the future. That's kind of how I get myself interested into prehistory in addition to watching your channel is what will humans look like? What will they be like, uh, you know, thousands of years in the future, in the future. And yeah. I really think, uh, they're going to be so different that they might as well be aliens. Um, yeah. Who knows if the nations that we live in today exist? Oh, no you know, way. That, yeah. If we're talking in the thousands of years, for no sure. Way. not. Yeah. But, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, maybe in a thousand years, I don't know. That's possible, but especially with the, uh, you know, potential of cyborg type stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of with machines. The robot archaeologists will just be like mining our, our old cities. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I think is it's it, your turn. Yeah. Is it my turn? We're almost done here. <laughs> Let me see. I should have been ticking them off as I've gone. What's your What's your uh, favorite thing about the Midwest? What do people get wrong about it? What's the What's What's so What do you love about it? Yeah. Well, there's probably more than one thing. I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is cost of living is cheaper than anywhere else in the country, generally, yeah. um, and so. How much? You know, uh, but let, let's. I wonder if we could. Can you think of something we could compare? Like what? Like in for cost the, of living? Yeah. Oh yeah. Let me pull it up. I love doing this stuff. We kidding? Uh, <laughs> like, uh, there's a website I go to called uh, Spurling's Best Places, and we can enter right now our our uh, cities and the cost of living. I'll I'll pull it up here for you. Um, this is not entirely accurate i get it um but it's just you know in general um yeah you can compare uh so like if you if okay there's a city compare function can you see that yeah all right so portland oregon oh portland oregon whilst you're typing this in can i just say when i first moved to america and I wasn't used to living in such a big country. I tried to order a pizza from a place in Portland, Maine, thinking I had called the right place. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, where do you live? And I was like, Prescott Street. And they're like, where the hell is Prescott Street? There's no, there's nowhere like nice. that. This is a, that's a future compared video, probably, by the way, Portland, yeah. Oregon and Portland, Maine compared. But this is a, you get a snapshot of the cost of living differences. So like comparing my hometown to yours, uh, you see, wow. uh, so it's 54.5% less expensive than Portland where I live compared to you. So, um, Damn. that's just a little sample there. <laughs> and you know, it, people do complain about the weather. I love four seasons. I, I, I like it when it's like right now it is 
15 degrees out and there's snow on the ground and I'm okay with that as long as it's only like, you know, no more than three months a year. I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. Overall, well, though, I see myself eventually moving somewhere else, not too far from the Midwest, but I, I got to have my mountains. That's the thing I, I uh, but family is here. So yeah, yeah. it's always hard. Well, do you think you'll just go to Colorado or somewhere like that? Um, Utah? Not Colorado. There's too many wildfires and it's too expensive. Uh, I really like Virginia personally. I, I, a lot mm. of history there too. And you got the Blue Ridge Mountains and stuff. But um, plus you're not too far from D.C. Yeah. I don't want to ever live in D.C. Um, I will say something that is uh, people say like, oh, I just love the people in the Midwest. They're so down to earth and they're so nice. Get out of town. Shut up. People are nice. Really? I, I get really. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to go the opposite way. I thought you were going to be like, no, no that's terrible. People, <laughs> people are. There's no special place where people are nicer. Oh, where people are more nicer in the country. No, they're not. There's nice people and mean people everywhere. You're yeah. not going to move to a place because the people were more down to earth and nice. Now, I will say, though, there is and this is backed up by research. Lots of studies on this, like the slower pace the town is like meaning there's like you don't have to try like the, the less traffic um generally people are more chill and so th there is something about a smaller town no matter where it be whether it be oregon california texas or kansas um people are generally just more chill like they're not gonna get uh they're not as high strung like you know yeah. you know you go to new york city and it's like I never forget when I was in New York City ordering food and they were just like, come on, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? I'm just like, I, I just want to look and take my time, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a thing. But as far as just nice people, it doesn't mean that they're mean in New York. It's just just, just the speed of life. So. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, I. Uh, fair enough. Would you so, ever move to any other part of the United States if it, the opportunity arose? Like, I mean, assuming that you know, your family would be OK with that. Uh, <laughs> i do really like the west coast i definitely love the atmosphere out here the the vibe as it were on the west coast yeah um like the great thing about oregon is that the state owns the entire coastline so there's no private beaches so you can explore the whole coast you're yes, free right. to explore the whole way we and did that fantastic we, were there. We, we just walked up and down by the what's that famous uh rock that sticks out the cannon beach cannon, rock. cannon beach that's it uh we yeah. had a hotel there oh one of my favorite places on earth that was amazing man it's so nice the oregon coast it's so nice if you get past uh, the rain yeah <laughs> in the summer it's great uh i don't know i would i would i do like to live close to the sea um but i really want to visit maine i want to see what's going down in maine it seems like a, an interesting state. I don't know. Something about it that intrigues me. Yeah, the, I get some free thinkers up there, independent minded folks. Yeah, I don't know. They got it's ranked just, choice voting. Do they? That's, yes. that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, they seem to be ahead of the curve in some things. Some things, that, sometimes I just read things about Maine and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So I don't know if I would live there, but I definitely want to go check it out for sure. But I do like living on the West Coast in terms of like it's very, I think it's a uh, reasonably progressive. Not it's not as progressive as people make out sometimes, but at least in Portland, you know, it's pretty like psych. Like their plans for the future of Portland are to make like a walkable city, a cyclable city. That's really important to me. I think the less we use our cars, the more we can walk to places. The the happier we'll be as well. Isn't the future of Portland no police? No, but <laughs> there's still lots of police. <laughs> uh, they were and get rid of the police. Those radical Antifa Portland yeah, yeah. years. One of my favorite want... is Portlandia, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Portlandia is really funny. It's a... <laughs> they just make fun of Portland. Portland. The whole yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it's true. Some of the things there are pretty spot on, but uh, I I honestly really like Portland, Oregon. I think it's a nice place. It gets a bad rap in the news, but it's a nice place, honestly. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, no segue again. 
Um, <laughs> so why are people, and I, we, I mentioned this at the very beginning of the live stream, why are people so biased um, for written history and against what you often research and study? Uh, we even call it prehistory. We can't even call it history. What is wrong with yeah. it? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I do tend to just call it all history, but I know technically history starts when we started writing, but um, I don't know. I think... Um, I think one of the challenges when we're talking about prehistory, if you were to think of it from an educational point of view, maybe a nationalistic point of view, is that it's hard to fit stories of prehistory into like a national narrative because none of these nations existed. Um, uh, I mean, in Britain, we do learn about like the pre-Roman period, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Neolithic period. But mainly we just view it through the lens of monuments they left behind, like Stonehenge. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really dig into the like the philosophical nitty gritty that they didn't even conceive of an idea of Britain at that time period. Yeah. Um, so I think I think in some ways, maybe that's why it is left out of uh, educational curriculums. Um, and maybe because because mm, i don't know maybe some people think it's hard to get it like ultimately maybe people think it's hard to get excited about just like an object for example but yeah but really you've got to think of the story behind it that's how you make it interesting it's harder but, to use your imagination right like it's, you, it's you have to words. use your imagination yeah a little bit um, because you're, you know, you're looking at rocks, you're looking at pottery. Maybe some people think it's not so super exciting. I don't know. Um, but the story behind those objects is, is fascinating for the most part, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, and it's, even, uh, I think, you know, even like there's always other with, even within recent history, people are biased for, for example, war, uh, revolutions like if you look at the most popular history videos on youtube it's i mean oversimplified what's he covering he's covering wars um and revolutions yeah yeah and uh conflict and um so that's our bias too and i i, I feel like so much of even re recent history is ignored and that's also what kind of drives me to make stuff sometimes so yeah why do you think as you went into it why because i've always been into it so it's hard for me to say why do you think you didn't pay it any much attention well part of it like you said maybe it was because it was i never was exposed to it growing up and as part of curriculums um but i think i think a, a lot of it is like yeah i can i feel like a connection you know with uh recent history like uh, i can the the towns we talk about the states we talk about um, the countries they still exist and so if they mm -hmm. existed back then i feel more connected to it so I, and and then also like i don't even know if you know when you think about um even homo sapiens the first homo sapiens were just radically different than than us too even though they're, even though they're the same species so and uh and then they're they're you know, mating with other species and um, like, how can I, don't I, know. I mean, I don't know how radically different they were. Honestly, honestly, I don't know. I mean, they well, were... see, that's me making the assumption. Yeah. I, we, I, I, I guess. Yeah. We don't know. Do we? I would think they wouldn't be. I think really like, not at like, wait a second I... though. We're talking like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Of evolution, though. I think you could take a kid. Let's say we took a kid from 100,000 years ago. Uh -huh. I think you could put him in a like a play group with a bunch of children from our time. And I think you couldn't pick out the cave child. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think you wouldn't be able to pick them out. I guess I see that. Yeah, because I... I'm, see, that's nothing. You, I never see... You know, like if you're studying... Um, you know, uh, even history from 500 or a thousand years ago, there's pictures that are painted, you know, whereas you're looking at bones, 
And yeah. I guess that's another thing. I'm like, I, I just make the assumption that they're just so much different than us, but really they weren't. Yeah. Yeah. We, we just need more folks like you to bring them to life. That's what it is. <laughs> that's what Subscribe it is. to Stefan Milo. There we go. That's yeah. right. That is right. Yeah. It's a, I think if you start, like you said, evolution does happen. Evolution is a reality. If you continue pushing back further and further in time, we're going to be able to start seeing differences and how we like innately behave. But I think from, I think honestly, from like a hundred thousand years, you couldn't pick them out. That's, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, whose go is it? Whose question was that? I think we're down to our last question? questions and I have to go pee. So this is working out. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's make it a quick one. What's your fitness routine, man? I just can't get into fitness. Atunsha asked me the same question. Are you serious? <laughs> really? Oh, sorry, I didn't catch that bit. Uh, no, I I think uh, well, I I told him this too, but like, it is uh something I started in high school and I just never stopped. Like, you know, you take the weightlifting class and then you just kind of most people stop after they get out of school and and I it was just always a good stress reliever. And, um, I think it's one of those things where I'm also kind of, I'm just weird. Like where I, it's almost OCD. Like I have to, I, like, if I don't go, then I, I feel depressed or whatever. You go to the gym every day. No, <laughs> I mean, there were, and when I was in college, I was going like four times a week. That was the most I ever went, but, um, yeah. now it's like two or three times uh, a week at most. And, I think there's just something where it's like becomes part of your, your life, your lifestyle or whatever. And, um, the other thing is like, I used to eat really badly, like, um, and then Mrs. Beat actually helped me eat a lot healthier. And that was, I think, uh, the biggest thing is like, I'm a, I'm just kind of frugal and stingy. Like, yeah. uh, and so I was always like, um, you know, it's an investment, like less medical bills later on. <laughs> Except for the freaking appendix. Yeah, I didn't stop that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You weren't so, working right. out your appendix, clearly. <laughs> uh, I think I remember something that I was always like that. Um, I heard that Tiger Woods could bench press 300 pounds. And that was yeah. something that really had a big effect on me. Like, he doesn't look like he can. And that motivated me. Like, maybe I can do that someday. So it's weird. Like, you kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, well, I haven't maxed out for a long time, but my all-time max was 340. So I used wow, to tell that's my a students lot of that weight. Like, yeah, well, you know, I have short arms. It helps. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, dang, your question is like, mine's a lot deeper. My last question for you. Uh, Go for it. What, <laughs> so you've studied, studied our beginnings as, as, a, as a species. What's your prediction for the end of us humans? I mean, the death of all things is inevitable. The death of every human. How? Is, is... How are we all going to go down? And have you seen uh, Don't Look Up, by the way? Have you seen that on Netflix? No, no, I haven't. I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, a, I, mean, to... I mean, comment. sorry, comment. I don't know that it's going to be an asteroid. I don't know. Mm, I don't know. Those things, are, those events are pretty rare that an asteroid is going to be so powerful. It's just going to wipe know. everything out. Ver Veritasium had a video about it and it got me rethinking about it. Like, oh no, maybe this is more likely. We've mapped, to the, we've mapped a lot of them though. We've mapped a lot of the trajectory of those big asteroids. We as far so as I'm many. aware. Yeah. We missed them. But I mean, but one on the scale of like the dinosaur extinction, that's going to plunge the earth into like a totally different epoch. That's really rare. That last one was like 60 million years ago, and there's no guarantee that humans will even live another million years. Um, so, so Okay, so what's going to kill us then? <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think we have such a stranglehold on the planet that we will die. I don't know that we're going to die out like with some small thing. Because we're going to continue to evolve as well. So another thing is maybe we don't die out, but maybe we just become something unrecognizable to how we are today is another thing. You know, given another 300,000 years, how will we look and act? It's hard to say. 
Well, that's we already are in a simulation, I guess. So maybe that's already what happened, right? Yeah. I suppose if I had to pick anything, it's going to be, I mean, if maybe some form of climate change will make like agriculture not possible, in which case the Earth's population is way too high and billions are going to die. But, but some will survive. But some will survive, yeah. And I think those that survive would be able to just like eke out for a long time. I don't know, maybe... Maybe well, there was we'll... that, that time in, in, in human history where there was only, what, a few thousand left, right? Yeah, something like the population dropped down to about 10,000 or so. But we're not fully sure about that. We're not fully sure about that. That, that was like uh, why... Graham Hancock brings that up, right? <laughs> that was like widely publicized at the time. But actually, when we look into it more, I don't know how sure we are about that. Oh. Um, because, again, you know, we're just picking apart prehistory and we get a new piece of the puzzle and then we're like oh wow this is significant and then we get a few more pieces of the puzzle or understand that piece better and we're like uh, uh maybe it wasn't such as bad as we thought <laughs> you know yeah it's hard to it's the genetics is really complicated but yeah i guess uh i don't know maybe yeah maybe it will just be an asteroid like that i'm curious one at some point the poles are going to flip yeah. Like we're already in the process of that. Apparently, I heard. Yeah, like, it's been uh, coming over the heading towards uh, Greenland, right? Or... I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but that would be interesting because maybe that'll destroy all our electronics or something, or maybe like maybe the atmosphere, the decay of the atmosphere. I've been <laughs> speculating too much. The decay of the atmosphere and like just being blasted by solar winds might would, would destroy us for sure. Yeah, personally, I think a super volcano is more likely than an asteroid, but... Uh, but I don't think that'll wipe us out. I think we're too resilient. I see, yeah. I think we, if we were alive at the time of the dinosaurs, I think we might have survived that. Because we're... What any... There's not a single environment in the world that we haven't learned to exploit. As long as one place in the world was still okay, we would live That's on true. That. We're, we literally have a, people living at the south pole right now yeah we have learned to exploit every single environment so yeah. i don't know what it would take to wipe us out honestly at this point all right well you've given me some more optimism i appreciate that <laughs> what a great way to end the, the live stream here um i guess we usually we're indestructible questions. guys <laughs> we take quick questions from the audience too i do have to go pee and i'm sure you're one itching to go too but uh if anyone I has some I have like, to go pee, yeah, but we can fire off a couple of quick ones. Yeah, if so, we'll give you a moment here if you have any questions, especially because I, I don't get a chance to talk to you. Uh, Maybe whilst they're doing questions, we could run back and pee. Okay. <laughs> I, have to on, I have to turn on the heater so they can't hear me. There's a bathroom back here. Okay, let's, let's do that. Pee break and then get some questions going. And... If you hear it flush like two or three times, I'm sorry. I've... <laughs> Oh, I knew I would pee faster. 
but I cheated because I didn't wash my hands. Duh, 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 duh. Anyone here? Mr. Beat peeing over the sound of the heating. <laughs> Did you wash your hands? You beat me peeing at the pee race. You beat me. <laughs> I knew I would. I'm the fastest peer in the West. That's oh my gosh, 113 me. people are still here. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to you guys. Oh, we look at that. JJ is still around. Uh, thank you, JJ. Um, okay, I guess we'll answer his. And then uh, also promote your... Uh, your podcast before we forget your new podcast that's going to come out we're still thinking um, that's not going to come out it seems okay then just ignore what i just said <laughs> yeah 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 oh, man, we'll uh, i'll about tell you about later. it in a bit yeah yeah okay uh well jj says why don't british kids learn about the uk prime ministers to the same extent american kids learn about u.s presidents i think um i don't know that's a good question i think maybe in terms of our history class from what I can remember, we're more focused on like a specific issue. And that issue would probably straddle multiple prime ministerships, uh, premierships. Um, so, for example, you know, you might cover uh, slavery, for example. That spanned, obviously, the time of, of many different prime ministers. And I maybe we don't, um, because we also have a king or queen to focus on, we're not viewing them as in a high regard as perhaps Americans view presidents because, you know, honestly, uh, the American love of presidents is almost cult-like for some people. It's so weird, yeah. So, hey, it like, me I know. So, like, it's almost, it's it's really a strong love. I, I think America is almost unique in that, maybe. I don't know. Probably. I, I would assume that. I, I need to learn more about that, too. Um the Song of Ice and Fire video books. All right. Have either of you read The Horse, the Wheel, and Language by David W. Anthony? And if so, what did you think of it? <clears throat> uh, it's actually on my bookshelf right now, but I haven't read it. <laughs> but I, I am very uh, familiar with the topic. Uh, and maybe The Song of Ice and Fire can correct me if I'm wrong. But this is basically the idea that at the start of the Bronze Age in Europe, the, the start of the Bronze Age in Europe coincided and was caused by this big uh, migration of people from what is now uh, Ukraine and Russia, the Eurasian steppe, and this new way of life with uh, uh, horses and, and cattle and um, um, a more nomadic way of life, also enabled by like bringing bronze technology with them. Uh, totally sort of replaced the Neolithic society that was in Europe at that time. And I think for the most part, that is borne out by the evidence. I think that is um, still currently uh, what archaeologists think happened at the at the start of the Bronze Age. It obviously varies like region to region, like in Italy and Spain and the further south you go. Um, it's This uh, culture seems to have had less of an impact genetically. And uh, pe archaeologists still hypothesize that the Basque people, because their language is so unique, it's not an Indo-European language. Um, that they are descendants of that Neolithic population, and that's why they have this like language isolate, this like little oh, language group yeah. that's all their own. Yeah. And all the other European languages are Indo-European because of this spread of Bronze Age people. Um, and as I said, I uh, I haven't read the book. I've read some of his like specific papers just on uh, specific issues connected to that. But I think it is mostly borne out by the evidence. Yeah. I have heard of it and have never read it. So <laughs> at least you have it on your bookshelf. Um, Dante, who's always very generous. So thank you, Dante. Um, any thoughts on the U.S. national debt? It's currently at $29 trillion. At some point, there's got to be consequences. That's a good one. I honestly don't know enough. I, I, I honestly don't know how we should like run the world or what's a good way for a country to operate. I mean, it seems... I don't know. I mean, uh, who... I suppose at some point there has to be consequences, but won't inflation make it like less significant? I wonder, you know, isn't that, isn't that, I heard this, I heard the saying that the only true limit on a nation's spending is inflation. 
and that basically yeah. it can rack up the tab until inflation is out of control. Well, there's different types of inflation. So when we we're talking about monetary inflation and I, you know, it is a concern. I've always like when I was younger, I used to be more concerned about the, the, the national debt. Um, now I, you know, as long as our GDP keeps going up, um, I think GDP, GDP to debt ratio is the most important thing. But even then, like you look at Japan and their GDP, GDP to debt, like they have way more debt than they have GDP annually. So, and they're doing okay so far, although they're not making many babies over there. So uh, that's going to yeah. be a potential crisis. And I think the, the key is um, production. Production has to keep going up and, um, doesn't mean that humans have to produce it. Obviously, uh, robots can maybe handle everything we need. But I think, uh, you know, I used to be more of a supply side dude, you know, like I was an Austrian school guy when I was younger. And now I, I understand the demand side of economics more. And I understand that maybe it's maybe it is more important than supply side. And so as long as uh, now we're seeing inflation out of control right now. And if you want to tie it to the national debt, um, I don't think it's related right now. Do you think it's related right now? Like, I don't know. I say I don't know enough to, your comfort zone. <laughs> to comment yeah. well, uh, as it's not about Bronze Age migrations. But um, yeah, the, the inflation we're seeing right now, I don't, I don't think it's related. Um, I don't but, think. I still don't feel like the inflation is out of control. I don't feel like I've noticed a massive difference. But maybe because I lived already in one of the most expensive parts of the country, that is a factor. Yeah. But, it doesn't like my my monthly expenditures it doesn't seem like it, it's dramatically increased like i'm sure if you crunch the numbers it, it would have increased by somewhat because obviously i'm not immune to in inflation i it doesn't feel like i'm living in a crisis in any way i don't know what the view is from the midwest it, but it doesn't feel like that to me here i'm locked into a mortgage so i'm fine that way but yeah food you definitely notice uh and obviously gas but i don't drive as much as i used to and but yeah no i people are hurting and i just i you know i think this the cause is still mostly like everybody has more money and they didn't get to spend it much uh over the past two years and i think we're going to know more in a few months like if this is more long term or not because yeah, yeah. it's i don't yeah i don't feel like the government has introduced any radical policy that has caused this do you know what I mean? Like, uh, well, some will argue that you know the the stimulus programs spent throughout the pandemic, the co Congress sp passing all these relief, you know, like the checks that you and I got for having kids, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I but wasn't much, but I, I would just say that people do have more savings. They do, and they uh, and. It's crazy, but incomes are finally rising. They've been rising for like three years now. It started during the the Trump years, and it's continuing during the Biden years. And yeah, I, uh, I mean, I mean, touch with this. I feel like, like I like I said, I haven't noticed a crisis. My, I. It's because you're a millionaire. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know how. I don't know how much the price of gas is. You'd have to ask my chauffeur. But. <laughs> <laughs> my footman that's my footman yeah uh, okay this pn Ber by the way thank you for all the super chats throughout um pn berkeley says do you think people could have come through the arctic into the americas from the east not just the west Ooh, the navajo say they came from the east i haven't heard that before that's interesting have you heard yeah. this before yeah this is um i mean <clears throat> there's there's more than one idea of this this is occasionally called the salutrian hypothesis uh i feel like well first of all like i said at the start when you're talking about graham hancock it's certainly a possibility it's a possibility that people did travel into the americas from east as well as west uh at the minute i don't feel like that is uh borne out by the evidence um the uh genetic evidence strongly suggests that uh, native american people are descended from a group that traveled across asia uh, not that we know everything about the genetics of Native American people, but that's what it suggests at the minute. Um, and 
and the the Navajo, I, I don't know enough about the Navajo um, origin story at all. Uh, but people have probably lived in the Americas for 20 or 30,000 years. So maybe even, you know, you could probably, there's the potential that could go back 40 or 50,000 years. That's uh, new. I mean, that's th those discoveries are, aren't they really new? Like within the last few years? we've Yeah. Yeah. There's still a lot of questions about it, but there are, there are now like enough sites that are around like the 25,000 year mark where you could say like people are. For sure, in at least some parts of the Americas by twenty five thousand years ago, and if it, and if you think you know, like we were just talking about how at the start of the Bronze Age there was a migration from Eastern Europe into Western Europe, and we can see that in the genetics, the Navajo could well have originated in a region far to the east of where they now live, and uh, they, they and, said it wasn't the Salutrian hypothesis. By the no, way, not asking about the Salutrian hypothesis. Well, I've. As I said, that's just one version of the story where people came in from the east as well as the west. Yeah, it's uh, all very close, but we don't have uh, evidence. It's possible. <laughs> it's it's possible. It's certainly possible. I just don't think it's uh, borne out by the evidence that we have at the minute. We don't have good evidence, like in where Europe, where Asia and um, Siberia meet. You know, it's actually the land would have touched. It would have actually been a yeah. land bridge. Whereas yeah. at the Atlantic, it still would have been ice. And we don't even know if the ice sheet actually extended all the way. Um, it's There's the potential that there was get, still gaps in the ice in the Atlantic Ocean. So it's, it's just not borne out by the evidence of the minute. It's a possibility, uh, but it's the evidence of the minute would not support that. Hmm. All right. Well, uh... as my understanding, not being an expert, as my understanding. Always got to always got to add that caveat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I think we'll, I'll, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Um, it's been almost three hours, believe it or not. Uh, I know. So I just want to thank you for coming on here to be my third guest, which I guess is now a series. Which I'm, I'm, I'm think I'm going to go ahead and put these up on uh, as a podcast and edit edit them a little bit, but uh, you know, get rid of the peeing and stuff. Um, that <laughs> keep the peeing in keep the peeing in uh but yeah no uh it's, it's a lot of fun honestly um because I, I consider you a colleague and everyone else Absolutely, that I, yeah i mean we it's kind of an isolating thing what we do uh as youtubers and so uh it's a good excuse to connect so thank you for joining and, my pleasure uh, my pleasure uh, audience thanks for sticking around as well and uh We'll do. Uh, it's looking like the ne the next guest will probably be Atlas Pro. Uh, him and I have been chatting. So um, if you watch this channel, uh, you know, great channel. Yeah. So uh, all right. Um, let's see. I always end it with Jeffrey Epstein didn't kill himself, and then we <laughs> find out. So until next time, bye bye.